Mayor, you may proceed. All right, thank you, Max. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is Friday, February 18th, 2022. This is the regular meeting of the commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach being conducted virtually out of an abundance of caution because of the pandemic. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order at two o'clock p.m. on the dot. And we'll start off with roll call. Commissioner Susan Gay. Commissioner, uh, she, she said here. <laughs> Very good. Commissioner Jay Legree. Here. Commissioner Tim Bennett. Here. Commissioner Tony Sharp. Here. Commissioner Patrick Gossett. Here. Commissioner Ed Chernowski. Good afternoon here. And uh, Mayor Stan Mills is here. We have a full complement of the mayor and commissioner, so we are able to formally conduct business today as we have a quorum in the room. I'd also I'd like to uh, identify some of the staff that help uh, make this meeting run, as well as our staff that will be participating in the meeting. That's Max Hamby and Brant McCormick from the IT department, uh, Ann Womack, city secretary, uh, city solicitor Glenn Mandalis, uh, Matthew Janice of the uh, Building and Licensing Department, uh, Kevin Williams, Public uh, Works uh, Supervisor, and City Manager Sharon Lynn. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, everybody that's watching virtually, and I'd also like to thank those that are registered to speak today. We have uh, 10 people that pre-registered to speak. Uh, and they include the following, Carol Everhart of the Rehoboth Beach Dewey Beach Chamber of Commerce, Dan Slagle and Greer Manival of the Rehoboth Beach Main Street, uh, David Hutt and uh, Betty Gallo uh, representing, uh, I believe, 330 Rehoboth Avenue, uh, Mr. Sarah Vastava, uh, citizen, Suzanne Good, citizen, Walter Brittingham, citizen, Dr. Michael Trehouse, uh, citizen and John Dewey citizen. Welcome to all 10 of you. Thank you for pre-registering to speak and we'll call on you to garner your feedback and input uh, at certain times during the meeting. Uh, with that, I want to remind everybody that support documents or documents that support our agenda topics uh, when they are ready uh, in sufficient time ahead of the meeting are embedded directly into the agenda. Uh, and you can get those support documents by going to the city website. On the right side, click on the box for city portal, uh, searching for the agenda for the particular meeting you want, and then click on the uh, amended or the agenda, uh, and you'll see uh, all the support documents accessible by links right there. Uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to uh, correspondence. Uh, when timely received, Correspondence is also embedded in the agenda, and you'll see seven pieces of uh, correspondence there that we'll uh, acknowledge uh, more so later. Uh, and there's also an eighth piece of correspondence from Diane Stein. It was received too late uh, to put in there, but I wanted to acknowledge her receipt. Uh, there are no minutes to approve today. They're not ready yet. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to the uh, city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon again, Commissioners. <clears throat> uh, we have two um, street aid expenditures, in the one in the uh, amount of $9,344.16 for streetlights to Delmarva Power, and a second one to Apple Electric in the amount of $560 for street streetlights. Uh, I'd like a motion to approve uh, uh, authorizing payment of uh, both those amounts in the total of $9,904.16. Mayor, I, I move approval of street aid expenditures in the amount of $9,904.16. Second. So we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Sarnowski and a second by Commissioner Sharp to approve uh, the payment of uh, two vendors. Uh, in the total amount of $9,904.16. Is there any discussion? If not, like all those in favor, signify by saying aye and hold your hand up, meaning aye until we can get a count. Aye. So we, uh, aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, everybody. 
Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next item of business, which is the city solicitor's report. Mayor, I uh, just have a, oh, some I'm other sorry, comments. you have something else? Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, weather permitting, and it doesn't look like uh, it will be good weather next week, Del Dot will begin concrete repairs on the Route 1A bridge over the canal on Wednesday. Work is expected to take about a week, and work will take place from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. daily. While the bridge will not be closed, traffic will be significantly impacted, and it's recommended that drivers either use State Road or Byard Avenue to enter and leave the city. The uh, playground equipment for Lake Girard Playground and the fencing have been installed at Lake Girard. Our contractor is waiting for a few uh, consecutive warm, dry days to schedule the installation of the surfacing and we expect to open the playground early this spring. Um, as you know, the uh, playground was designed for children ages two to five, uh, located at Lake Avenue and First Street, and it will be accessible uh, also for children based on their abilities. Uh, for more than 100 years, the Beach Patrol has provided lifeguarding services that ensure the visitors to the city, um, the nation's summer capital that is, enjoy days on the beach that are safe and memory making for the right reasons. The Beach Patrol currently is holding tryouts for the 2022 season and uh, the uh, seasonal employment page is up and running on the city's website. In addition to the um, Beach Patrol, the city has seasonal employment opportunities in, in its police streets, parking and parks of Department. Uh, all of this information can also be found on the city's website. Uh, I believe uh, the city solicitor will comment on the um, accessible parking case. Uh, the city plans to make repairs to the sewer main at Maryland and First Street starting on Tuesday, March 1. Traffic on the adjoining streets will be restricted to local traffic only during the construction period and that uh, work is scheduled from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, on March 1. All parking on meters on Rehoboth Avenue have been removed in anticipation of the installation of the uh, new T2 parking meters, which have been ordered. The Water Department repaired a leak in the service line in front of Dolly's on Wednesday, and uh, the city has signed a three-year lease extension with the owner of the um, Wells Farm, where the city applies wastewater treatment plant biosolids. Terms of the agreement are the same as the city's current lease. The bid opening for phase 3B wastewater treatment plant updates have been extended until February 24 to accommodate some of the questions received at the February 1 pre-bid meeting. And water replacement, water meter replacements in the Bay Harbor and Eagle Drive communities outside of the city have been completed. Also, the Grove Park public restroom, restrooms have been freshly painted. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, uh, City Manager Lynn. Are there any questions of the City Manager? If not, uh, thank you. We'll move on to City Solicitor's report, Glenn. Thank you, Mayor. Just a few litigation updates. Um, as you all are aware of the Ocean Bay Mart case, there was an appeal filed to the Supreme Court. We're in the process of, of briefing that now. Uh, I suspect that at some point the court will announce a date for oral argument, but that's not been announced yet. And again, I'm anticipating a final decision in that case probably in November of this year. Um, the Lingo versus Board of Adjustment case, this is the, the deck variance case that deals with measuring floor area. Um, oral argument is set in that case in the Supreme Court for Wednesday, April 27 at 11.10 a.m. Um, I, I don't know at this point whether they'll be open to the public to see it. It's a very, I, if you've been in there, it's a very small um, courtroom, courtroom where they actually conduct the oral arguments for Supreme Court, but it is, it is typically open. So again, that's Wednesday, April 27 at 11, 10 a.m. Um, the final case is the one that uh, the city manager mentioned. It's the Hancherick versus the city uh, of Rehoboth Beach case. This is the ADA case dealing with accessible parking on and around Rehoboth Avenue. The, the argument, the plaintiffs were arguing that we did, the city does not have enough accessible parking on Rehoboth Avenue. 
Um, it's one of those cases that, you know, we felt that it was very, very winnable, but it's not the kind of case that you'd be proud to win because you don't want, you know, you want to be accessible. So to the city manager's credit and to the city staff credit, they sort of rolled up their sleeves and said, let's have a dialogue and see if there's a way that we can resolve this case in a way that um, works for everybody. So that process, thankfully, um, was successful. We've resolved the, the case. I mean, there's, there's a few loose ends that still need to be filed with the court, but it's for all intents and purposes, it's resolved. And it, it's resolved with the city installing um, nine additional accessible spaces in 2022, three additional ones in 2023, and three additional ones in 2024. Um, a lot of those spaces are come at a very low cost. It's just striping in some, in some areas and painting some curb. So it wasn't a case that you know, resulted in a lot of expenditures for the city. And um, their, their side was very interested in having their attorney's fees paid. We ended up resolving it without paying any, any attorney's fees. So it's kind of a, it's one that I'm kind of happy with the result because it does provide these accessible spaces. And, and I was really proud of, of the city staff to see how um, eager they were to find a way to, to make this work rather than digging our heels in and trying to, to litigate this. Like I said, it wouldn't be a case we'd be proud to win. So um, that's um, the three pieces of litigation we have going right now. Are there any questions? Thank you, Glenn. Thanks. Uh, with that, we'll move on to departmental reports uh, from building and licensing, uh, fire department and the police, and they are embedded in the agenda for your viewing pleasure. Uh, beyond that, uh, board and uh, commission reports, none have been identified. Uh, committee reports, none have been identified. And so we'll move on to our liaison reports. Uh, the the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yes, Carol Everhart. Oh, sorry. That's all right. I was just, just saying you were here with us. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'll start with the occupancy. I'm just going for this year now. So we're looking at uh, January 1 through mid-February. Uh, last year, midweek, uh, there were 6,312 occupied rooms. This year, 8,343. On the weekend, January 1 again through mid-February. Weekend, last year, 8,390. This year, 10,711. So I think you can see that that's increasing again. All indicators we have are it is going to be, again, a very heavy visitation year. Legislatively, a state, I'll start with SB1. Uh, Senator McBride has made herself available um, through the state chamber. I will be pushing out a link to a webinar if you'd like to watch it on that bill. Um, and uh, unfortunately, even with the concessions to date, um, the um, membership is not in support of it, nor is the chamber board. Um, also, um, legaliz legalization of recreational marijuana, that continues to be opposed by the chamber. Federally, uh, there's been some movement on the bipartisan J-1 USA bill. That bill basically is an assist to allowing, I'd say, additional J-1 students in and in some specific areas. So it may be something like camp counselors or any of a number of other specific areas. But it ba basically raises the cap on how many J-1s can come in. Um, I do want to mention that the International Student Outreach Program, which is our local program that provides lunches, uh, uh, education-wise, as far as taking them uh, to other parts of the United States while they're here or maybe into DC, that program is in jeopardy of not happening. And basically it's because of housing. Um, this, getting the students housed is a huge issue and the organizations and the sponsors are just uncomfortable with sending them. So if we don't have the students, we're not gonna have the program. I would say it'll be another four weeks before we know for sure. Uh, there's another bill, uh, federal, SB 208. That bill deals with you have an employee and they are either relieved of their responsibility or they quit 
and when do they get that paycheck? And the bill as written basically required before the next paycheck was due. What was missing in the bill was um, the equipment. So I might have a laptop at home, I might have a uniform, I might have any number of uh, pieces of equipment that belong to the company. So they are correcting that. The other information I have is really on events. Um, March 10th is the awards banquet and installation um, and that uh, of the Chamber Board. And that'll be here at Dogfish. Merchant's Attic is at Cape and Lupin High School on the March 26th. Um, we've sold 56 of the 100 spaces there, so that's, that's going to go. Job fair, uh, we have a request for a job fair, so we're having a job fair. It's going to be held at the Fairfield Inn on Route 1 on the 30th of March. Sidewalk sales are a go for the 20th through the 22nd of May. And then another new event, which is uh, Restaurant Week supports the red, white, and blue, is going to run June 5th through 10th. And that's going to be uh, beachwide, the whole coast. So um, stand by for information on that. We did have the honor of recognizing um, uh, Rehoboth Beach for 60 years of its bandstand, and Corey was able to be there. And uh, we also were able to recognize the VIA for their volunteer assistance at the kiosk on the weekends. And that's all I have, unless you have a question. Questions for Carol. Thank you very much, Carol. We appreciate that. Uh, with that, we're going to go to the Historical Society. Uh, Commissioner Legree, you're the uh, liaison. Unmute. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, two things. Number one, the museum reopens on 4 March. As you know, it's been closed. And uh, the opening is accompanied by a new exhibit called The Storm of 62. And a few of us can remember The Storm of 62, but uh, I didn't start coming to Rehoboth until 67. So I didn't miss The Storm of 62. Boy, I hate that. But Hal Dukes has a great book. And if you haven't read it, read it. it anyway, that's number one. And number two, uh, I'm told by the museum that they're hoping to get the dolly sign up on the uh, west side of the museum where it's designed to go, hopefully by the first part of May. Now, a lot of that's going to weather permitting and if everything goes fine. Uh, they've done well with their, with their uh, donations for the, for the museum but they're still a few dollars short and they're gonna to continue uh, to take donations until the end of February. So if, you're, if you've got any spare bucks and they'll take anything, uh, get on the website, RehobothBeachMuseum.org and click on the donation uh, button and you can just donate to your heart's content for the dollar sign. Thanks, Mayor. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Uh, with that, we're going to go to Main Street, the uh, liaison, Commissioner uh, Ed Chernowski. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I, I believe we've got uh, Dan Slagle on the on the line. Dan or Greer, are you there? Yeah, it's not joining. Neither has joined. Uh, well then, I, I will uh, attempt to give a brief update, Mayor. Um, they, uh, Main Street is hosting a, a um, meatball contest um, in March. Uh, the dates are... Uh, March 9th uh, and March 10th, um, participating restaurants will be Ava's, DeFibos, Nicola, Nicola's, uh, Lupo, and Sazio. Um, and this is a meatball showdown um, happening on those days. Um, other than that, I think uh, Main Street gave a pretty extensive update um, in our last meeting, so that, that's all I've got. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, with that, we'll stay, stick with you as liaison to uh, Cape and Lopen Senior Center. Um, thanks. Uh, the Senior Center um, 
recently elected new officers and new board members, um, and they are still, um, they've got one board seat vacant. So I'm gonna throw that out there in the, into the world to see if anyone's uh, interested on being, being uh, on the board of the Senior Center. There is one vacancy on the board that they're looking for. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, with that, uh, we'll end the liaison reports and we'll move on to uh, the next item of business, which is a uh, public hearing. It's a public hearing on the subject of amending the Rehoboth Beach zoning map referred to at chapter 270, specifically section 270-7 of the municipal code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, and the zoning district boundaries as referred to at chapter 270 section 270-8 of the municipal code by rezoning a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, Sussex County, uh, noted parcel uh, there uh, from R1 single family residence district to C1 central commercial district. Uh, I'd like to uh, have the applicants representatives identify themselves. David, are you there? Max, can we uh, get them on camera? Can. David, can you hear us? I can hear you. Are, are you able to hear me? Uh, yes, we can. And uh, who else is there with you uh, today? Uh, sitting to my right and your left is Don Lockwood. All right. And, and Ms. Gallo was attempting to join online, but I don't think she was able to. All right, thank you. Glad you're here. Uh, I'd like to uh, start off by identifying the support documents that are embedded in the agenda. There's, uh, and I'm going to be brief on here, but a uh, letter dated June 7th is the original letter uh, requesting a change of zone application. Uh, second support item is a letter dated March 5th, 2012. It actually is just a, a superimposition of the, uh, it should have been 2021 from David Hutt. Uh, also reiterating the desire for a change of zone request. The next item is a memo dated August 30th, 2021 from Tom West, uh, giving a consultant uh, planner's review of the uh, application. Uh, the next support document is the declaration of restrictive covenants for 330 Rehoboth Avenue presented by the folks at 330 Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, there is a memo dated December 21st, 2021 uh, from Michael Bryan doing a summary of the December 7th Planning Commission meeting. Uh, again, that's just a summary it preceded uh, approved minutes that I'll talk about later. Uh, another support document is a letter dated January 3rd from uh, Mayor Mills, myself to David Hutt, just uh, giving the status of the rezoning request. Uh, the next support document is the adopted resolution setting the public hearing. Next support document is the draft ordinance uh, in the matter of rezoning 330 Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, there's also the approved planning commission meeting minutes of the December 10th, 2021 meeting and updated February 16th on the portal. Uh, is the addition of a colored zoning map uh, that's dated uh, May 23rd. That was updated because the previous one, uh, as you saw, was in black and white. Um, this has been a process that's been going on, as you know, for uh, about two and a quarter years. And I just want to highlight that the process has been very well documented, in my opinion, and archived in the online portal. So you can follow beginning to this point. Uh, Glenn, um, uh, let's see, let's review uh, noticing requirements real quick. Uh, are there any special noticing requirements we needed to adhere to, Glenn? This, thing, this is subject to a public hearing, Mayor, so it needed to be published 15 days in advance, which I'm certain the city secretary has, has taken care of. Thank you, Glenn. And Ann, can you confirm that uh, we noticed everything properly? The adopted resolution was posted on the board outside of the admin office in City Hall on January 25th, 
and also posted to the document center in on the portal. Uh, Yeah, I don't the, know who did that, but a little levity. Thank, thank you. The resolution was uh, published in the Cape Gazette on January 28th, Coast Press on February February 2nd, and Delaware State News on January 28th. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, Ann, for, for letting us know everything is uh, uh, all right. Uh, with that, Glenn, if you don't mind, uh, would you read the actual ordinance that we're addressing today? I'd be uh, not, happy the, not the resolution, but just the ordinance, I think, would be suffice. We'll, we'll do. Thank you, Mayor. So this is an ordinance to amend the Rehoboth Beach zoning map referred to at Chapter 270, Section 270-7 of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, and the zoning district boundaries as referred to at Chapter 270, Section 270-8 of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, by rezoning a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, Sussex County Tax Parcel Number 334-14.17-139.00, from R1, Single Family Residence District, to C1, Central Commercial District. Be it ordained by the Commissioners of Rehoboth Beach in session met in the manner following to wit. Section 1. The Rehoboth Beach zoning map referred to in Chapter 270, Section 270-7 of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, and the zoning district boundaries referred to in, in Chapter 270, Section 270-8 of the Municipal Code of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, 2001, as amended, B, and the same is hereby further amended by rezoning a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, Sussex County Tax Parcel 334, dash 14.17-139.00 from R1 single family residence district to C1 central commercial district such that the entire parcel shall be designated C1 central commercial district. Section two of any provision of this ordinance shall be deemed or held to be invalid or unenforceable for any reason whatsoever, then such invalidity or unenforceability shall not affect any other provision of this ordinance, which may be given effect without such invalid or unenforceable provision and to this end, the provisions of this ordinance are hereby declared to be severable. Section three, this ordinance shall take effect immediately upon its adoption by a majority vote of the commissioners of the city of Rehoboth Beach. The synopsis of the ordinance is that this ordinance rezones a portion of the property located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, Sussex County Tax Parcel 334-14.17-139.00 from R1 Single Family Residence District to C1 Central Commercial District, such that the entire parcel shall be designated C1 Central Commercial District. So that is the ordinance that's the subject of today's public hearing, Mayor. Now, thank you, Glenn. Uh, I'd like to review the process before we move forward. The uh, process here on out is that the uh, applica uh, applicant will be uh, asked to make his presentation next. Uh, and then the commissioners will be allowed to uh, ask questions of the applicant and then enter into comment and discussion. Uh, after that's satisfied, uh, we'll conduct a public hearing and identify correspondents and individuals to speak uh, and uh, go, go from forward from there. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Hutt, if you would like to have the floor and uh, uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to uh, introduce to us today. Thank you, Mayor Mills uh, and commissioners and the staff that are present, as well as uh, those listening online. Uh, for the record, my name is David Hutt. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Morris James. Uh, this afternoon, I'm representing 330 Hospitality Group, LLC, which is comprised of Limitless Development Construction Consulting 2, LLC, and Chain Street, LLC. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the gentleman sitting next to me, uh, to my right, uh, is Don Lockwood. He's a principal of one of those entities. Uh, the principals of the other entity uh, are the Gallows uh, and Betty Gallo attempted to join us uh, and for uh, reasons, uh, other reasons was not unable to do so, uh, but they are the, uh, the principals of these entities that own the property at 330 Rehoboth Avenue. As was indicated when the mayor introduced uh, this application, there is somewhat of an extended history uh, with uh, this rezoning application. So I thought it might be helpful to start with a quick explanation of how we arrived here at this public hearing uh, this afternoon. 
It began in January of 2019. Uh, with the planning commission performing a sketch plan review or conceptual plan review uh, for a hotel uh, at 330 Rehoboth Avenue, uh, which was dubbed the Grand. Uh, one of the primary purposes of that sketch plan review was to begin to address the issues uh, that would arise from the split zoning of the property. Essentially, the discussion during that January meeting was that there are two routes uh, to go to redevelop uh, this property at the gateway to the city, uh, and that is to either one, have a series of variances that would likely include both use variances as well as area variances, or two, to have a rezoning of the property, which is the public hearing we're here for this afternoon. At that time, uh, the then chairman of the Planning Commission, Chairman Mellon, uh, conducted a straw poll of the Planning Commission. Uh, the consensus at that time was that it would be better to seek a rezoning uh, than a series of variances. And certainly uh, this makes sense because it matches good land use planning uh, as everyone can then rely upon and apply consistently uh, the zoning code that the city has and that the people who of course apply that range from the property owner, neighbors to the property. Uh, but in addition, of course, the engineers who work on the site, the town's staff and the town's engineers and professionals have one consistent zoning code that they can apply uh, to the property. After that conceptual or sketch plan review with the Planning Commission, uh, the application or letter application was put together and filed with the city on June 7th, 2019. Uh, and the mayor already introduced it. That is found in the packet embedded in the agenda at pages 36 to 39. The mayor and city commissioners uh, then in June of 2019 referred uh, the application to the Planning Commission and asked for a recommendation on uh, this uh, rezoning request. In August of 2019, the Planning Commission considered uh, the application. And it's important to note that at this time in 2019, uh, my client was the 99 year tenant of the property and the landlord uh, and the tenant, my client were involved in a dispute and uh, about their lease, the terms of the lease and at that time, uh, because of litigation, uh, the landlord um, objected to the tenants standing to bring the change of zone application. And the result of that at, at the August 9th, 2019 meeting before the Planning Commission was that the Planning Commission's recommendation uh, did not substantively tackle uh, the change of zone application, but instead uh, recommended that the consideration of the change of zone request be delayed uh, or stayed until the litigation was concluded uh, regarding the standing of the landlord and, and tenant. Uh, the lawsuit was uh, concluded uh, and my client is now the owner of the property. Uh, and uh, with the resolution of the lawsuit, uh, there was a subsequent request made uh, to remove the stay on this matter. And I'm embarrassed to admit that was my transposition that said that the letter was filed in 2012 uh -huh. instead of 2021. I guess that'll be remembered for all time now. Uh, but that letter uh, is found uh, in the packet at pages 40 to 41. And that asked the Planning Commission to remove the stay uh, and reconsider uh, the substance of the change of zone application. There was a, a series of uh, meetings and discussions with the Planning Commission. Uh, and on December 10th uh, of this past year, 2021, uh, in a split vote, of uh, five to three with one abstention. Uh, the Planning Commission did recommend denial of the change of zone application uh, with many of the reasons related to uh, a variance application process uh, and also responses uh, were directed at the proposed restrictive covenant. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, here in a couple minutes. That's the history of how we got here this afternoon. And with that procedural background, I wanted to take a few minutes to describe the property, although I'm sure it needs very little description uh, for all of you, uh, but it is at, located at 330 Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, and as you know, that's the intersection of Rehoboth Avenue and State Road. The comprehensive development plan identifies two entry streets, and that's a, a term of art uh, that, that is on the, the street map for the city when you look at a comprehensive development plan. And those two entry streets are Rehoboth Avenue and State Road. So this property 
fronts on both of the entry streets uh, into the city or is at the gateway of the city. As you know, along the Rehoboth Avenue frontage, uh, there is a building on the property. And then along the State Road frontage, uh, there is, of course, parking for the building uh, that sits along Rehoboth Avenue. To help uh, orient everyone, of course, behind the property is the condominium complex uh, that's known as Scarborough Village. And building six of that condominium uh, is the building within the condominium that is closest to the property that's, uh, and the closest to the building that is currently on the property and closest, of course, to where the proposed hotel building uh, was going to be located, is going to be located. Behind and beside the parking area, essentially um, surrounding the parking area, are single family lots that are part of Country Club Estates. When you go across State Road, uh, there is the Barrister Building and a piece of property that is owned uh, by the city. The property is currently used as office space uh, for uh, my client's business for Limitless. Uh, but of course, even with that history, I think most often when people talk about this property uh, in the city of Rehoboth Beach, it's referred to as the former location of the Seahorse Restaurant. And that seems to be how most people identify that because that was a landmark restaurant uh, in the city uh, for about 30 years. Of course, for people who predate uh, that time period in the city of Rehoboth Beach, uh, prior to being uh, the Seahorse, it was the Horse and Buggy uh, restaurant. And then, uh, of course, the Seahorse followed that. And after the Seahorse, there were several other businesses uh, that were located there. Uh, many of you will probably remember that Donardo's uh, was located there. Uh, after Donardo's, there was Chili Billy's. Uh, and then that's when the restaurant uses ceased. And then after that, uh, Ocean Atlantic Sotheby's uh, had its offices uh, in that building. And then, of course, currently Limitless has it, its offices in the building. That's a, a quick history of the commercial uses uh, of the property uh, for more than the last half century. But one of the questions that came up during the Planning Commission's review, and I'm sure is a question that many of the commissioners may have uh, this afternoon, is do we know how this split zoning arose? Uh, how did this come to be that this property has a portion that's zoned C1 and a portion that is zoned R1? And I can't give you a definitive 110% correct answer uh, this afternoon, but what title review and review of various plots and plans for the city uh, revealed is that this property lies between, uh, it has parts of, but then parts of it lie between uh, two of the significant founding projects in the history of the city. And those projects being uh, the Rehoboth Beach Camp Meeting Association uh, and Country Club Estates. When you look at old plots for the city, those are of course two of the founding plots uh, that laid out uh, much of the city of Rehoboth Beach. What that title work and those plots show is that this parcel uh, is comprised of three distinct areas. Uh, one of those is the area right along Rehoboth Avenue is part of the original Rehoboth Beach Camp Meeting Association plot and development. And then if you move to the rear of the property, there is a triangular portion of the property uh, that looks like at one point in time, it may have been a corner of land from section three of Country Club Estates although it was just a little triangle of land that was separated from all the other lots uh, and had no frontage on a street, uh, whether it be State Road uh, or an internal street within Country Club Estates. Nestled in between those two areas, uh, there was a piece of land that was titled in the name of Eastern Shore Public Utility. And if you follow Eastern Shore Public Utilities history of name changes uh, and mergers, uh, that is an entity that ultimately became known as Delmarva Power. Uh, and of course, all of those various pieces of property uh, were assembled uh, into what then became the location of the horse and buggy and then the seahorse and those other commercial uses that I talked about. In fact, one of the interesting things is when you look at those plots originally, uh, there is not a connection that is shown uh, between State Road and Rehoboth Avenue on those plots. And I think that emphasizes that these were separate and distinct projects uh, in the city and, and development projects as to how they were originally laid out. And for the history buffs that are out there, State Road on those old plots was not called State Road. Uh, it was actually referred to as Old Bay Road uh, on those plots. Of course, as we know today, State Road uh, certainly connects uh, to Rehoboth Avenue and those are the entry streets uh, into the city. I point out this, this 
legal history or title history because it's the most logical explanation as to how the split zoning arose. Um, there was just various pieces of property uh, that were part of these two developments. There's a piece in between them that was owned by utility. And when they were assembled together, uh, they then uh, were assembled together in this fashion uh, and have existed for more than half a century with uh, the business building components of the property being situated along Rehoboth Avenue and parking for those uh, situated along State Road. The two attachments to the original application that was filed on June 7th, 2019, uh, show the, all the specifics and actual details uh, of the property. And again, that can be found at pages 36 to 39 uh, in the embedded uh, documents that are on, in the online packet. And one of those documents uh, is of course the survey prepared by uh, Foresight Services that shows the boundaries of the property uh, and that the, and the total area for the property of 42,494 square feet. The last page of that application uh, is a document that serves multiple purposes, uh, that, and that includes aerial imagery, a zoning map uh, overlay, uh, and the zoning line uh, that splits uh, this property into two sections. And before I go on with that, that is the page that the mayor referred to uh, when I looked at the embedded materials. Um, that original page, probably through scanning and, and other uh, ways to put that online, uh, was not as easy to read and was not in color. And of course, the zoning districts don't show up uh, on a, a black and white uh, image of that. And so that was embedded again at page 69 of the packet uh, by Ms. Womack. And uh, so that, if you look at page 69 of the packet, then you can see the various uh, zoning districts and the imagery, the aerial imagery that's underneath the zoning district shows up better uh, on those images. When you look at the, both the survey and that plot, you can see uh, that there is a little more than 23,000 square feet of the parcel that is zoned C1, and then around 19,425 square feet of the parcel that are presently zoned uh, R1. And when you look at the image, uh, you can of course see uh, the building six of Scarborough Village, uh, which is shown uh, in the green uh, color uh, right behind uh, the outlined, the property, which is outlined in red. Uh, and then, of course, you can see the country club uh, estates properties uh, that also surround uh, the parking lot there that I referenced at the outset uh, of my comments. In speaking with uh, several of the uh, long-term uh, Rehoboth Beach residents, and in fact, um, during the discussions with the Planning Commission, for the entirety of the, the known history of the, this property in Rehoboth Beach, the configuration has been uh, exactly as you see it today. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the Planning Commission members commented uh, that his knowledge of the property was at least 47 years, uh, and that the configuration with the the commercial building being located along Rehoboth Avenue and the parking for that building being located along State Road uh, is how he remembers that property being situated uh, throughout that entire time. And in fact, uh, one of the letters or a letter of uh, support for this application is from uh, Diane Stein, uh, the prior owner of the property. Uh, and she confirms again that that is the configuration of the property uh, throughout uh, its history. The significance of all this uh, to this afternoon's application uh, is that all of these uses, beginning with the horse and buggy all the way to the current uh, office use uh, that is going on there, are all non-conforming uh, as parking for a commercial business uh, is not allowed to occur on residentially zoned property. Of course, it didn't matter as much when these things arose uh, and likely due to the length of time that this non-conformity has existed along with the current building and parking configuration. The nonconformity simply existed uh, on the site and I don't believe much thought was given to it by anyone. However, due to the age and condition of the building, a redevelopment of this site requires the demolition of the existing structure and construction of new improvements. And it's the need to demolish the existing structure uh, to, as part of that redevelopment process that of course highlights the issue we're here on today, which is the split zoning of the property 
uh, and how to be able to move forward with the redevelopment uh, of this piece of property. As the commissioners are likely aware, uh, split zoning of properties is disfavored, uh, both as a land use concept and then also at law. At law, it's referred to as being haphazard. Uh, and this disfavoring, of course, makes sense uh, as a general principle, but also in the context of this specific property. At the beginning, I mentioned the January 11th uh, sketch plan or conceptual plan meeting that was conducted with uh, the Planning Commission. And during that meeting, a lot of the discussion related to uh, the issues and variances that would be necessary or might be necessary if the property remains a uh, split zone. In fact, Mr. Molina, your former building inspector, uh, provided a, a report uh, to the Planning Commission about some of those uh, issues that would arise. Of course, one of those was that the permitted uses of the two separate zoning dif districts are different. Uh, the calculation of FAR is, of course, different in those two zoning districts. The same is true of the calculation of area coverage. And of course, all of the height, bulk, and area requirements are also different as to the residential zoning classification and the commercial zoning classification. This would lead to a series, uh, a series rather, of variances that would be necessary through file, a filing or filings with the Board of Adjustment. And those are not going to be easy filings uh, and, and for anyone, uh, whether it's the city, uh, the Board of Adjustment, the staff, uh, the applicant, uh, because they're going to involve very novel questions uh, and interpretations of the zoning code. And of course, those novel interpretations are required because you will not find in your zoning code a provision that deals with how to uh, deal with FAR and area coverage and height, bulk, and area differences when there are two separate zoning classifications that are on a split zone piece of property or a piece that has two zoning classifications. Zoning codes aren't intended to uh, deal with those matters, and so there's no provision that you would find, like you will find standards for a property that's zoned C1 or a property that's zoned R1. There are no specific standards for when you have a property that includes both of those zoning districts. So from the outset of this matter, uh, the applicant pursued the rezoning application as the best path for the redevelopment of the property. And of course, the goal of any redevelopment of a site, uh, frankly, whether it's in the city of Rehoboth Beach or anywhere else, uh, should be to minimize any nonconformities uh, and to minimize or eliminate any variances uh, that might be necessary. When dealing with rezonings, uh, one of the documents that's always vital to those uh, considerations is the comprehensive development plan. And when you look at the comprehensive development plan, it talks about the success of the renewal uh, of Rehoboth Avenue. And while this property is likely not what was expressly anticipated in those comments uh, that are found in the code, because those comments are largely directed to the first two blocks uh, of Rehoboth Beach, the redevelopment of this site uh, towards the western end of Rehoboth Avenue would be a continuation of that success uh, and that strategy uh, for the renewal of Rehoboth Avenue in the comprehensive development plan. As, as you all know, the, certainly your comprehensive development plan is presently, or the update to it, is presently being considered uh, and in a, a work in process. But as you also know, practically speaking, there has been uh, some renewal of this end of Rehoboth a Avenue already, both in the long term and the short term. Of course, everyone knows uh, one example would be the rede redevelopment of the Dogfish Head uh, site, which is on the same side of Rehoboth Avenue uh, as this property. Going back a few years, of course, Culture Pearl uh, redeveloped its site. And even when you move further west on Rehoboth Avenue, there are a number of uh, successful uh, businesses, uh, restaurants and other items there, uh, including uh, a restaurant like Egg. Uh, when you look even further in the comprehensive development plan, one of the priority actions that's set forth uh, in the executive summary and I will quote it, is to encourage and assist interested property owners in the creative redevelopment of properties on Rehoboth Avenue and its connecting streets. And of course, 
this property fits that as it is on Rehoboth Avenue and is not only on a connecting street, but it's on one of the other entry streets uh, into the city, placing it of, of even greater importance uh, as it sits at the gateway to the city. The request to rezone this property would resolve those conflicts and questions between the various uh, zoning classifications and would leave the property with one homogenous zoning classification to which Mr. Janice and, and his staff, as well as the applicant's uh, engineer, uh, could apply your zoning code uh, evenly across the property. Throughout uh, this process, as uh, this, the mayor and commissioners know, uh, the city did hire a city planner uh, and Mr. West was asked by the planning commission to review uh, the plans, uh, or, or rather the, not the plans, uh, but the change of zone application uh, and his report is embedded into your agenda at pages 42 to 48. And Mr. West's report uh, at the bottom of the second to last page states, and I'll, I'll read this, that uh, based on this cursory review of the current CDP policies, a change to C1 could be consistent with policies promoting revitalization in corridor and gateway areas but could exacerbate concerns related to impacts to adjacent residential areas. I highlight that because I think uh, that portion from Mr. West's report is a good summary of the two competing concepts uh, that uh, exist uh, in the comprehensive development plan regarding this property. And again, this property is simply a microcosm of that. And when you look at the recommendation section of Mr. West's report, which is on the last page, page 48 in the embedded packet. The second sentence of that states as follows, since a change from the R1 to the C1 district would provide the opportunity to develop that portion of the site with higher intensity uses and structures by right, it would not be advisable to change the current zoning without, and then he lists two point subpoints under that, and A, the first subpoint is revising the CDP policies to reflect policy refinements, or B, obtaining assurances that goals to maintain adjacent residential neighborhood integrity could be achieved. Certainly it is, it is not within my client's ability to refine uh, the comprehensive development plan policies, although those policies don't need a great deal of refinement as they indicate that revitalization of businesses and properties along Rehoboth Avenue is important uh, and especially important for some a property that sits at the gateway to the community on those two entry streets identified by the comprehensive development plan. What was in my client's ability uh, to uh, assist with though was the second part, the or after that, which is to obtain assurances that goals to maintain adjacent residential neighborhood integrity could be achieved. And through a series of discussions, uh, both with the planning commission and then um, between uh, my client and Mr. Mandalis and uh, Mr. West, a set, of a set of restrictive covenants was proposed for the property uh, and is in also embedded in, uh, into the agenda at pages 49 to 57. And what I wanted to review here this afternoon was how that uh, assists with and satisfies what Mr. West indicated in his report would be necessary in order for the prop a change of zone to occur for this property. And that was to obtain assurances about goals to maintain adjacent residential neighborhood integrity. So I wanted to review very quickly the restrictive covenant and begin with who are the quote unquote benefited parties uh, of that restrictive covenant. And one of those parties would be the city itself uh, and the other parties are all of the adjacent property owners. And if you've looked at that, each one of the properties that has a common boundary with this property is specifically identified uh, in the restrictive covenant. And it's sig the significance of who the benefited parties are is how that restrictive covenant might be able to be changed. And that's the long-term protection of uh, the integrity of the residential neighborhoods that are nearby. What the restrictive covenant as it's proposed states is that it requires two thirds approval 
of the benefited parties, which would be all of those adjacent property owners as well as the city. And so it would not be simple at all for uh, my client to go out and attempt to modify uh, this restrictive covenant. Uh, frankly, as the city would be a party, I would anticipate, although Mr. Uh, Mandelis can certainly advise you on this, but if the city were going to authorize a change to this restrictive covenant, it's likely something that would occur at a, a meeting uh, such as this, uh, where all of the city would participate or be able to participate. And then with respect to the protection that's afforded uh, to the adjacent uh, residential neighborhoods, there are two primary restrictions that you find and, and are proposed by the property owner. One of those is a vertical construction limitation. And what was done is to establish that is to show the footprint of the building, uh, the hotel building as it's proposed. And then there is a five foot latitude in case final engineering determines that <clears throat> there's an elevator shaft or something like that that needs to extend out a little further. Uh, so there is uh, some room for final engineering comments and review, uh, but that footprint of the building would be the extent of the vertical improvements uh, on the property. And the balance of the property outside of that footprint would, would be where the parking is located. And if you've had a chance to look at that plan, of course, that means that the property would continue to be used as it has in the past with the building being situated along Rehoboth Avenue and parking uh, by the residential neighborhood, the country club, estate, single family lots. The second uh, protection that's afforded uh, to the adjacent property owners uh, is that the rear yard and side yard setback or rear yard setback would be doubled from five feet to 10 feet. Uh, and I know that there, this has been uh, the, res the subject of uh, comments uh, from individuals in the public, uh, as well as comments during the Planning Commission's review of this. But it's not unusual for there to be commercial districts and residential districts that uh, abut each other. Uh, that occurs uh, throughout the city um, in many locations. And the city's zoning code has a protection that's built in when that situation arises. A as you know, in general, in Rehoboth Beach, commercial properties uh, have what I'll call a zero lot line, which means a person can build from uh, one of the property boundaries to the other, uh, subject to FAR and, and coverage requirements. Uh, but the building envelope is essentially is the boundaries of the lot. However, the city uh, in its zoning code uh, says, when we have a commercial district that abuts a residential district, we're going to make sure that there's a buffer there. And the buffer that the city zoning code requires is a five foot setback or separation from the property line as well as a screen. What the restrictive covenant uh, proposes uh, is to double that setback. Uh, and this largely because of where the building is situated, of course, uh, would benefit the individuals in the Scarborough Village uh, condominium complex, but it would double that uh, requirement to a 10 foot setback uh, along with the, the screening. In fact, that's more separation than exists today between the current building uh, and the, the property line uh, that's at the rear of the property uh, right behind the building. So the proposed restrictive covenant uh, that my client uh, would, re would record uh, to uh, restrict the use of this property uh, would help maintain the adjacent residential neighborhoods uh, as was suggested uh, in Mr. West report uh, by keeping the building and parking aligned just as they have been for more than half a century and doubling that separation distance uh, between the commercial use uh, and the rear property line that is adjacent to the uh, residential use. Today's uh, request, uh, again, which began uh, in 2019, uh, is that the uh, mayor and commissioners uh, grant this change of zone application uh, to the allow, allow the re redevelopment of this property situated at the gateway uh, of Rehoboth Beach. That concludes my uh, presentation and certainly myself uh, and Mr. Lockwood are available to answer any questions that members of the mayor and the commissioners may have. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Hutt. Uh, with that, I wanna remind everybody of the process. Uh, the next thing on our uh, 
Uh, the next step forward is to allow commissioner questions of the applicants. Uh, then we'll go into discussion and co any comments among the commissioners before then conducting the public hearing. Uh, with that, uh, commissioners, do you have any questions of uh, Mr. Hutt? Uh, we've got Commissioner Bennett. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I have, uh, I have two quick questions. The first one being, was the property purchased as one entity or one lot? And the second question is, if I look at what's embedded in the, uh, in the documents on page 57, it seems to show that there's no plan to actually build something on what is currently the parking lot, so that will just remain parking. Is that true? That's, those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Hutt. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Bennett. And uh, the answer is yes, that the where there is a parking lot today, the answer to your second question is that where there is a parking lot today, uh, there would be a parking lot uh, in the future uh, under this plan. And that's where the vertical improvement limitation uh, is the protection that's afforded uh, to neighboring property owners is it will, the property will continue to exist uh, as, or the uses will continue to exist as they presently do. By way of full disclosure, the building does, the corner of the building does go a little bit into the R1 portion. But as you can see on that plan, uh, on the page you referenced, the majority of the R1, overwhelming majority remains uh, a parking lot as it is today. The so, that, so, that's, so that's not a parking structure or a parking garage, it's just on, on land parking. Correct, there, there is a parking structure that's underground, but the, what you see there is the at grade parking. There is no parking garage that extends vertically from that, that is correct. Thank you. And, and your first question was that whether or not the property was purchased as one lot. And, and the answer to that is yes. Um, the property is recognized as one tax parcel and has, has been one lot or one piece of property for, for decades at, at this point. So I guess for my own uh, education, is it taxed differently then because it's mixed, mixed zoned? I do not believe it is taxed any, any differently. I believe it is the, the improvements are taxed all the way as though they exist across the property. It's, you know, it's taxed as a, as one property. And is it taxed as commercial or is it taxed as uh, R1? I believe it's commercial, but I'm not 100% sure. We believe it's taxed as a commercial property, but I, I'd have to, <laughs> And the, the city may be able to answer that question better than I, uh, if there's somebody that can answer that question. But my understanding is it is taxed as a commercial property. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, remember, we're asking questions of the applicant. Uh, Commissioner Gay, please. Um, let, why don't you go ahead? Commissioner Gossett has a question. Go ahead, because I have a, a, a couple of statements. I want to make more than a question, I think. Commissioner Gossett? Commissioner Gossett, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt, for the presentation. Um, relating back to that tax question, could you clarify, are you referring to city taxes or county taxes as parcels being uh, single or multiple parcels? It's one tax bill. It's the property owners receive one tax bill. And I, I think it's the, the answer is the same, irrespective of whether we're talking about the city or uh, the county, it's viewed as one parcel uh, in, uh, to my knowledge, in both locations, it is one piece of property. I'm, I'm not disputing you, but I would like to see some, some um, actual facts on that because I know on, on many cases in the city, the tax records for the city are a bit different from the way the taxes for the county are, are present. They may be the same, but I'm just, um, I, I would like to see some, some specific evidence on that also. And jumping to the respective or the restrictive covenant, is there a period of that uh, time that that runs or what is that design? What is written in the restrictive covenant now is a 30 year time period. Uh, there was concern at the planning commission that perhaps that time period uh, was not long enough. Uh, and my client would have no objection to a 50 year restrictive covenant. Uh, they're hopeful that a hotel at this location would be 
become a landmark uh, situation like you had with uh, the Seahorse restaurant where people identify the entrance to the Seabury Hayworth Beach. They used to identify it with the Seahorse and now it would be with this hotel. So if, if 50 years would give greater peace of mind, that could be added to uh, the restrict or modified within the restrictive covenant, but it does say 30 presently. Um, and I also, earlier in your presentation, I, I thought I heard something about a 99 year lease. Is that, um, does that play into this at all or I, I misunderstand you? It does not. Uh, there was a, uh, my client was the tenant of a 99 year lease on the property. Uh, and that is that former litigation, which has been resolved and there is no more lease as my client uh, owns the interest in the property. Okay. Um, thank you. And, and um, let's see, I guess that's it for now. I, I have some other thoughts uh, later on, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, commission, commissioners, uh, any further comments or questions for the uh, applicant before we go to Commissioner Gay? Uh, hearing none, seeing none, uh, Commissioner Gay, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, um, first of all, since this was the first rezoning I'd been, been part of, um, I wanted to research uh, to see if there were any previous rezonings and to see what happened there. And I found quite a lot of interesting information. And I just want to share my screen for a minute to show uh, two quick uh, visuals of that. Um, First of all, you see here, the, uh, this is the, the full zoning map of the city. I'm just seeing this for, for sort of orientation purposes. Um, the, the purple is, is R1, obviously that's the majority of the city. This bright green here is also residential though. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the R2 zone. And down in the area, this property is, is located right here where my cursor is. And down in the area of this property, you'll see a number of bright green uh, areas that are, that are residential in addition to the purple. Um, so here's what I learned when I did my research. These parcels were actually the subjects of rezoning uh, three different times in the last oh, 18, 19 years. Um, this part of Columbia Avenue here uh, was rezoned from commercial to residential. Um, these several blocks of Sussex Street also used to be commercial. They were rezoned from C1 to R2 uh, in 2006. And the most recent and the largest one, uh, and this was interesting because I knew that the old Oak Grove Motel area had been rezoned residential. What I didn't realize was that all of Sixth Street was rezoned at the same time. This was in 2009. So this is far and away the largest of the rezonings. But again, it went from C1 to R2. And the, the parcel in question I just outlined here because all these are obviously relatively close um, to, the, uh, to the project we're considering today. And to me, that's a pretty stark picture of, uh, of what the city's desires are. The fact that all these ha have gone, um, and I'll stop sharing the screen so I can come back on now, um, have gone from, from commercial to residential. But the other, so the other thing I looked at was, uh, you mentioned the, the planner's report. And I, I read in his report, he quoted two sections of the CDP and the planning commission had quite a lot of discussions about this. And they indicated that zoning changes are, have to be evaluated uh, with the relevant policies of the CDP. And one of those policies was that the zoning code would be uh, drawn to avoid negative impacts of commercial development on residential neighborhoods. And then his report also says that the C CDP goes on to say that the city will eliminate any current commercial uses that have a clear potential for adverse impacts. And so that's exactly what happened with those other rezonings. But what we have today is the complete opposite of that. And so, okay. can, can, I, can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah. Uh, I, I think probably more appropriate for questions for the for the applicant at this point, and then hear from the public, and then to the extent you've drawn conclusions of any sort, that would be the right time to probably go through it. Okay, that's fine. I, I think okay. the rest of it were just going to be some points related to some things the planning commission said, but I wanted to throw the research out there because I wasn't sure how many people knew about the rezonings. I didn't until I looked into right. it. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. Any uh, further Commissioner comments before we go to a uh, public hearing? 
just one question. Uh, um, if we have questions from the plant for the planning commission or what took place, who do we address those to during this hearing? Well, the planning commission uh, did not want to uh, send a representative here today because they wanted the documents to uh, stand for themselves. So it, we had questions of it, then we just, there's no representation from them other than right. the written documents. Correct. It's correct. It may not be right, but it's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there's no further uh, commissioner comments, then we'll go to uh, the public hearing. I'll open that up. I would like first to identify the correspondence that we received. Uh, as you can see uh, embedded in the agenda, there are seven uh, letters, uh, all, all of them on this topic. Uh, and uh, the first one is from uh, uh, Country Club of States property owners. Uh, within the letter, it did not identify how many members they have, but uh, Commissioner Gay, you're a member of uh, Country Club of States Property Owners Association. How many members do they have? About 300. Uh, we've got about 300. Uh, we've got uh, a letter from the Rehoboth Beach Homeowners Association. Uh, I believe they have, I'm guessing, between five and 600 uh, members. Uh, we also received uh, correspondence from uh, a resident at 245 Country Club Drive, uh, a resident from 64 Henlopen, and resident from 60, 605 Scarborough Village, uh, two residents from uh, 221 Munson, and a resident from 221 Hickman. Uh, that uh, all seven of those are uh, disfavoring uh, rezoning. And then if you recall, I mentioned that uh, we received an eighth uh, letter from Diane Stein. It was too late to embed in the agenda and she was in favor of the rezoning. I think she was a, the former owner, if I, if I recall correctly. Uh, and of course, there's other correspondence uh, received by the Planning Commission during the Planning Commission uh, deliberations on this topic that were all available again on the city portal. So having identified uh, correspondence, I'd like to go to the individuals that would like to speak today in favor or against or just commenting. Uh, and we'll start uh, down our list of pre-registered uh, members of the public. Carol Everhart, do you have any comment to uh, uh, on the zoning uh, issue, please? Well, based on, on what I heard, and I, I'd like to hear a further comment, but um, supporting the C1 rezoning, if it results in the redevelopment um, and revitalization of the property, uh, I believe that that would be something that we would certainly support. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan and Greer are still not on from Main Street. Uh, we got the... Uh, Mr. Uh, Sarah Vastava, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Very good. Uh, I, my wife and I are residents of Building 6 in Scarborough Village, and that's the building that is closest to the subject property, and there are eight units in that building, and we are uh, expect us to be impacted the most from this, uh, if this property is being shown. Uh, six out of the eight owners of these buildings are original owners. We bought in 1983. And at that time, we saw the zoning maps and saw the property to be zoned residential. And so we, uh, can you still hear me? No? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, we bought with the assumption that that property, if ever developed, which is where the parking lot is right now, would be a residential, typically single family homes appro with appropriate setbacks and two story high uh, uh, single homes. And now we're looking at something totally different. Uh, also, uh, we feel that if this goes through, uh, it's, the, it's going to have significant impact on residents of this building, uh, of Building 6. Uh, specifically, the sun in the afternoon shines from the west in, and we have balconies on that side. 
that many of the residents uh, sit and sun in, the sun would be blocked. Now, not on the total building, it'll depend on uh, how far uh, the four-story construction intrudes on the residential part. Uh, also wanted to say that the 2019 proposal ha was also for a hotel, but the footprint of that hotel was smaller than what is being proposed now. Uh, this one is sticking out further into the residential uh, zoning and therefore it will have great impact on, uh, on building six. Uh, in addition to blocking the sun, if once this property gets used as a hotel with restaurants and whatever, we're, we're concerned about noise. Uh, we have drainage problems already from this property of making it worse. Uh, there's an existing fence, which is not very stable. We're concerned about that and trash and odors. And we feel as, as a whole, this will uh, devalue our property. Uh, the rezoning, uh, and, and, and another concern, we, we're not sure the rezoning, despite the restrictions, will stand up uh, and uh, a different property owner or even this property owner could choose to, once the property gets rezoned, develop it in a commercial manner uh, with anything or everything that's allowed in commercial zoning. And uh, I, I feel that uh, this, you know, I understand the need to uh, rebuild old building uh, and, and so on. But if, if the building part could be restricted to the uh, commercial zoning mm -hmm. and the resident, I mean, the the parking would occupy the current residential zoning as it does right now. Uh, I am the belief that at least um, that you can uh, approve that as a non-conforming use. So uh, I would I would like like not this is the rezoning not to happen. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Serafasava. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to the next member of the public, Suzanne Good, please. Suzanne, state hey. your Suzanne, state your uh, address and then uh, start, please. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to preface what I'm saying with the background that in recent budget discussions, uh, less money is being allocated to legal fees for the upcoming year. And the explanation for that was just sort of the hope that lawsuits would diminish. Well, unless we take a firmer stand on this particular case, which to me is um, needs to be decided against the rezoning for multiple reasons, we'll, we'll continue to send a message, a clear message, message to developers and to landowners owners like Ms. Gallo, that negotiation is the, ro the route to go with the city. And I, I know most of you are aware, but I wasn't aware until I moved here year round that anytime the planning commission meets, and this has gone back to January of 2019 with this particular uh, uh, 330 Rehoboth Avenue, um, uh, up until very recently, Mr. Mandalis was, had to be present and paid for every hour the Planning Commission deliberated issues related to this. And now we have a, a, another very able attorney, Mr. Luke Mehta, who, who's doing it, uh, in that role. But um, I don't think any, I don't think, I think very little of this litigation is creating value for residents or for anyone else. I did hear Ms. Gallo speak, uh, I was probably three or four months ago at one of the endless planning commission meetings on this. And I heard her say, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I, I, I have not had time to go back and get verbatim what she said, that she was not going to do anything inappropriate on uh, the land if it were rezoned C1. So I feel that promises like that 
are worth about uh, about nothing. And uh, I do see there's there's the uh, intent to uh, create a 10 foot set, setback, including a buffer. What I see as a better option for someone like a, a landowner and a real estate uh, agent, in fact, I believe she, uh, Ms. Gallo owns an entire real estate agency, perhaps outdoor gazebos for hotel guests could be put in that corner that immediately abuts uh, Scarborough Village, including the gentleman and his wife who just spoke. Uh, let's seriously, uh, let's take the Tree City USA uh membership seriously, but I just don't see any reason to grant this because it will open, continue to keep the floodgates open to this sort of, I mean, look how long this has gone on since January of 2019, and there were multiple planning commission meetings in 2021 alone. Ms. Gallo only acquired the land, granted, I believe, in January of 2021, uh, but so for, for many reasons, um, I am concern that we continue a bad precedent if we allow um, developers and landowners to hear that uh, Ms. Gallo and her council prevailed in, in this um, in, in, in their, their, their legal case that they brought basically. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Walter Brenningham, please. And based on what I've heard, and there are so many changes that can happen, um, I don't think you should leave any room for things to get changed in the future. And I think it, the zoning should stay as it is now, and I think it should be a no. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Dr. Trejos, please. Are you there? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. Uh, no comment on this item. All right. Thank you. I'll check in with you later, Doctor. Uh, John Dewey? Uh, please give uh, your please give your address and then uh, your comments, please. Uh, this is John Dewey speaking. Uh, my partner and I own a home at 105 Scarborough Avenue. Uh, I do have a role on the planning commission. However, I will be speaking only as a private citizen, and will uh, limit my remarks uh, and uh, to stay within that context. I'll also point out that I did recuse myself from all discussions regarding 330 following my appointment to the Planning Commission. I'd like to take an opportunity to point out uh, for the purpose of the record that in addition to the uh, letters that are included in today's agenda, there were a total of 29 letters provided previously uh, to the Planning Commission and all of those letters on record disfavor. They were all against uh, the rezoning request. Um, I'd also like to provide a little bit of personal context in that uh, my partner and I bought our first property in 1985 in the 200 block of Philadelphia Street. At that time, our property faced the parking lot for the Dinner Bell uh, restaurant. In 96, we purchased our current lot, uh, we purchased the lot, built a home at 105 Scarborough Avenue facing the uh, former Walls apartment. So we've got long years of experience coexisting with and working together with uh, commercial properties. So I I think a, a realistic person when it comes to trying to accommodate and work together. That's important to keep in mind because when we made both of those purchases, we looked very carefully at the city zoning maps. The city zoning maps, including the property directly across from 210, which was a parking lot, is now a private home because that was an R1 lot. When we bought the lot at 105 Scarborough Avenue, we looked at the map across the street from us for Walls's. The lots for Walls's that face Scarborough Avenue are R1 lots. If you want to look a little bit more deeply at the um, arrangements for the uh, larger Belmore property, that property is C3 on Christian and R1 on Philadelphia Street. So there are multiple properties in the city that still 
face similar circumstances to the parcel that's under consideration. The letters are coming from private homeowners. I'm speaking as a private homeowner. I don't have the financial resources to hire high powered attorney firms to advocate for my position. I have to advocate for myself. I have to do my own due diligence. I have to learn the law and requirements as best I can and make my best decisions based on that research. City maps need to have meaning. We have been hearing from many people who have made home purchase decisions based on the city's published zoning maps. Those maps need to be relied upon. You have individual property owners making life commitments to these properties and to the city based on the information that's being provided. The, the uh, property owner, uh, the investment group, has another pathway that is available to them to achieve their goal. They can apply for the needed variances with the Board of Adjustment in order to redevelop the property. By moving through that process rather than rezoning, that would open a door to a more uh, collegial working together between the city, abutting neighbors, and the developer to assure that the needs of all were being properly addressed. I urge the commissioners to vote against the rezoning request in order to avoid creating a really quite dangerous legal precedent that would affect multiple parcels within the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dewey. Uh, would, to the commissioners, we need not close the record today nor even vote today, but th there are different paths forward if we want more time to cogitate and uh, allow for more public in input, uh, yes, then, there is, then there is that opportunity. But Glenn, do you want to uh, explain potential paths forward? Sure, I was just gonna ask, typically the applicant is given an opportunity to respond to things that were said. Did you wanna allow for um, final comments by the applicant? Sure, I'll come back to you, Glenn. Then uh, Mr. Hutt will uh, give the floor back to you then. Uh, very, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, very briefly, um, the, uh, the so I think the last uh, speaker, Mr. Dewey, um, you know, he indicated there would be a more uh, collegial uh, atmosphere uh, through a variance process. Uh, but a, a variance process, yeah, I don't know that has any more collegiality than the planning commission's uh, process. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, as I indicated earlier, those types of processes are, are disfavored at the law and through land use. You should be looking for ways when you redevelop a property uh, to minimize uh, those uh, types of uh, non-conformities and perhaps eliminate them. And Significantly, uh, you know, one of the comments uh, was about um, the, the height of a building and there is no change as to what would be allowed as to the height of the building. Uh, certainly what's allowed in C1 today uh, is gonna be allowed in C1, but that's where the protection of that vertical height limitation comes in because the extent of the building would be exactly uh, as it's shown on that plot. And so the, those are, that's a, a protection uh, with a, a firm result uh, that benefits uh, the neighboring property owners uh, because you've heard about expectations of what people were looking at uh, when they purchased adjacent properties. And what's proposed here this afternoon with the change of zone and the restrictive covenant preserves those expectations. A person bought next to a parking lot uh, that was being used in conjunction with a commercial business. And what is proposed uh, is that the parking lot stays almost exactly as it is. There is a portion of the building uh, that goes a little bit into that, but it doesn't come close to any setbacks or adjacent property owners. Uh, so that is the, the reason why uh, that was designed that way. And again, significantly, that's what the city's planner uh, said uh, in the recommendation as to how this change of zone can be approved in conformity with the comprehensive development plan 
and protection afforded to uh, the adjacent uh, property owners. And so all of those items uh, work together. Uh, the other thing I would note, and is a, you heard it uh, this afternoon uh, in the comments from the public, is there is not opposition to the redevelopment of this property, or there appears to be very minimal if there's opposition to the development of this property. It's about the process. Uh, and there's, a, for some reason, there's a preference to go through a, a board of adjustment variance process, uh, as opposed to a rezoning with a restrictive covenant where you know exactly what you're going to get uh, at the end of the day. And as indicated, both in land use principles and at law, the preferred process and the better process is the change of zone process. And rec again, right out of recognition that there's gonna be concerns from adjacent property owners, that's why there was a restrictive covenant proposed. Uh, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions that that raised, uh, Mr. Mayor, but that, that's our response in res to uh, what we heard from the public. Thank you, Mr. Hutt. Any further questions for uh, Mr. Hutt, uh, representing 330 Rovith Avenue from the commissioners? Commissioner, yeah. Commissioner Gay, you got your yeah. hand up. Go ahead. It also might be a question uh, for Glenn. Am, am I right? It, it, so the, the parking, the current parking lot is a non-conforming use and could be continued as such in its entirety, the part the current of what exists in the current parking lot? That's correct. It could be continued. Without a variance. Correct. So then I guess I would ask you, Mr. Hutt, um, I know you said that, that the reason you would, are going through this complex process and the reason you would may have to go through an, another complex process of the variance is because some of the hotel does go into that lot. So with 23,000 square feet on the commercial lot, for the largest portion of the entire lot is on that C1 already. Couldn't you do the hotel there and, and keep the lot and then you don't have to go through the variance process and everybody's happy? The, my quick answer to that is that Mr. Molina took a different position than what Mr. Mandalis just spoke about parking being permitted for the hotel on the adjacent property. Um, Mr. Molina indicated that that would require a variance moving forward. Um, if that's not the city's position, that's a, that would be a change uh, from what we had heard before. Um, so I, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that since that, that position just changed, I, I, it sounds like. Well, I, I, I think that needs to be confirmed. Glenn, do you have any further response or confirmation? I don't, I mean, if the entire property were rede redeveloped, there may need um, that portion to come into conformance, but if the R1 portion remained um, parking, I, I think that that non-conforming use could continue on the R1 portion. But ultimately that's, you know, the decision for the building officials office. And I don't know if Mr. Janice has um, weighed in on that question. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gossett. Um, yeah, I, I um, Commissioner Chernowski was before me. Let him go ahead. I, I be thinking here for a second. Commissioner Chernowski, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess my, my question is, do we have the ability to, to hear from Glenn in an executive session? Well, uh, we would have to, uh, Glenn, I think we would have to continue this meeting to be able to, because we did not advertise the possibility of going into executive session. Glenn, is that correct? FOIA actually does allow you to go into executive session if things arise during the meeting that need private consultation with, with your attorney. The, um, the part of the issue here is that IT has set this already up and we've got public in and we have to make sure that the public are no longer in the virtual space so that we could have that meeting. Um, another option for you, and I, I think Mary, you were gonna ask me what the options are going forward and this, this raises um, that issue. You know, one of your options today is to close the public hearing at some point and deliberate this and decide it today. Another option is to close the public hearing and not deliberate or decide it today, reconvene in another meeting at a, at a later date to deliberate and decide it. And then a third option is to leave the record open um, for written comment in case somebody heard something in the public and they're kind of thinking it through and they want to they, they want to weigh in but 
aren't ready to yet, you can leave it open for written comment for maybe another week and then reconvene at a later date and decide, deliberate and decide. If there's, you know, if there's, if there's a need to have the question answered as to the parking and whether it could continue, um, you might want to choose one of those um, second two options so that you come back at a later date and decide if, if, if that's um, a matter that you want to hear more about. If there's something different that the commissioner wants to hear in executive session, you know, that, that's, another, that's another issue. I, Glenn, I just think it's important for us to know what the legal ramifications may be, whether we vote for or against this. Um, I think there, there may be ramifications either way, and I think it's important for us to, to know that. Um, I, my, my, my second question uh, or, or comment is, it, it, it at least appears that one of the commissioners uh, made some public comments here in this meeting that alluded to that there was already a predetermined uh, a, a predetermination on, on how they would vote um, and, and brought some bias into the meeting. And I, I wonder if that should cause for a, a recusal. That, that's a topic. Glenn, Glenn you, you stopped <laughs> that person from any further comment because of what was being said. Yeah, that, that's a topic we're not going to discuss here today, other than I'll, I'll say that showing the, the, the illustrations, the maps, um, that's evidence that any commissioner could have brought and, and no problem whatsoever with that. Um, so I don't think that there, anyways, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on, on it here. I hear you. Well, I think uh, I think there could be some benefit to uh, leaving the record open a little longer uh, and convening another meeting in the near future uh, to allow time to actually address the uh, question that was posed about the use of the parking lot and the, the perhaps discrepancy between uh, former building inspectors' interpretation and uh, the city solicitor's interpretation. So that I, I would likely lean that direction so that we can get more clarity uh, and have that opportunity to convene in an executive session of, during and before that next meeting, uh, which uh, we would have to schedule. And I don't, I, I don't know exactly when it would be. Uh, Commissioner Gossett, then Commissioner Bennett. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is uh, to Solicitor. Um, to your knowledge, has the city ever been a party to a restrictive covenant as being as is being suggested here? Now, I'm trying to think if in the Oak Grove case, if, if there is any restrictions, I, I know that one point we talked about them and I don't think that it, it ever materialized. So I, I, I think the answer is no, Commissioner Gossett. Yeah, I, I as being a part of that decision when I was on the Planning Commission, I. I the restrictive governments were, were not ever in, uh, brought forward, if you will, it was not part of the final uh, agreement of, of Oak Grove, if you will, uh, as, as I remember it. Um, I the right. only portion was a, a investment in the canal bank, if you will, but other than that, there was, there was no issues about the, the change or the approval of that aspect. Um, and uh, if we go forward with this, it's, it's in, in another meeting though, um, I would also, if you could bring to the table the aspects of restricted government covenants, uh, are they, do they go with the deed? Do they go with the land? Do they go with the use? Um, are they designed that way? Or could you be a little more informative to us of, of the options that uh, if a restricted covenant is uh, discussed further or options here, really how enforceable is that? You know, whose responsibility of that is? And, and again, does it go uh, with a structure or, or with the, the land? I, I can speak generally to that now. I mean, restrictive covenant does run with the land and it's it, it's just a contract in nature. So it's a contract between the benefited parties that are laid out within the covenant and the city being one of them and the owner of the property. So to remove the restrictive covenant from the property, generally you need to have all of those benefit part, benefited parties in agreement and signing off to, to remove the restrictive covenant. So, and it does, and it does run with the land. It does run with the land. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So uh, as does a, um, a zoning change or what have you, zoning would obviously is, is the way the land is going. Right. Um, okay. Um, somebody else, I've, uh, let me rethink some stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bennett. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, if, uh, if we do continue, I would like to have confirmation uh, to my question earlier as to how the property is taxed, whether it's taxed as a commercial uh, property only or taxed um, both ways. Sure, sure, thank you, thank, thank you. Um, uh, well, one other I, question, if I may, or, or no. request here, um, if we do no. go to another meeting, I, I would ask that you know, we have a plan, a member of the planning commission representative or a voice from planning commission representative so that, you know, how did they interpret it when it was brought forward? I mean, if this question comes up and, uh, you know, if it, if it did come up as, as part of the discussion, um, was it resolved or was it, it not brought forward? I, I think that, you know, the, the planning commission has been involved with this for longer than any of us and they should be able to, to respond to it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have uh, Glenn talk with Luke about that. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm leaning very heavily toward uh, leaving the public record open a little bit. And uh, uh, Sharp, uh, Commissioner Sharp, I'll get to you uh, next. And uh, allowing it to uh, go another week or so, whatever we need, because we, for, for FOIA, obviously we need to notice at least seven days in advance. But we need to give ourselves time to be able to answer some of the questions. I think the biggest question for me is, uh, the interpretation by former building and licensing inspector uh, versus uh, versus city solicitor Glendon Dallas's interpretation of how parking would work, uh, because if it goes one way or the other, it could uh, potentially resolve this. We heard from uh, one of the uh, residents that was the closest, he indicated he's the closest to the parking lot area, uh, that seemed to be receptive to retain it as a parking lot area. So uh, in my mind, we need to find out the, uh, the clarity uh, between, uh, of, I'm sorry, how, uh, how that parking lot can be used uh, before I make a decision. Uh, Commissioner Sharp, please. I just wanted to support you 100%, Mayor, on your, um, the way you just outlined next steps. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Gossett, your hand up again. Yes, it is. I, I just, um... I think we should also have an opinion from the current building inspector. Um, you know, there's a change of interpretation or what have you, and to relying on previous building inspectors' recommendations or comments, I, I just think we need to hear from the, the current building inspector and their interpretation of that brought forward if we go to a next meeting, which I think we should. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, that's moved. Uh, that would absolutely have to happen because uh, it doesn't matter what the previous building inspector said in my mind. It's matter what is appropriate today. It, whether, whether the current building and licensing corroborates uh, the former building inspector stance or whether they uh, create their own uh, new interpretation. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Hutt, go ahead. And this is uh, probably an echo or reiteration of, of what was said uh, just a few moments ago by many individuals, but Commissioner uh, Gay's question certainly presents a, a rather uh, simplistic solution to this. And if, if that's the, you know, if that's a, if that is viable and if that's what is confirmed, again, this, this matter is, is simplified and likely resolved. So no, I, and that's why I, I guess that echoes your sentiment of uh, hopefully the commissioners will get the answers to those questions and maybe it's the resolution of this matter. Yes, sir. Thank Mr. you. Lockwood, Mr. Lockwood also would like to comment if you may. Don Lockwood, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for spending the time with us today, and I appreciate all the hard thought that's gone into this. I know it's been a difficult issue for everyone. The main goal here is we'd just like to improve the site um, the best as possible for the city of Rehoboth. And if it's as simply as leaving the parking lot as it is, continuing to just build on the commercial site, me and my partners, the Gallows, would be 100% behind that. We'd like to just get this thing moving, if possible, as soon as possible. Thank you, and have a good weekend. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to see a new uh, pretty building on there, especially something that I can make reference to, because I'm one of those old-fashioned people that I came after Seahors, so I refer to that property as Chili Billies, and there are very few people that uh, even remember Chili Billies there. So uh, if I'm reading the consensus of... Uh, uh, 
uh, at least some of the commissioners, uh, the desires to uh, keep the public record open and uh, uh, conduct a meet, meeting in the future. Uh, we'll go to uh, Commissioner Gossett and Commissioner Chernowski, and then Glenn, I'm gonna ask you on whether we need uh, a formal vote or can go by consensus. Commissioner Gossett? I'm sorry, I had, did not lower my hand from before. Oh, but... goodness gracious. Okay, uh, Commissioner Chernowski, please. You're muted, Ed. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to confirm. Um, so even though um, that, that space that is currently R1 would mostly remain surface parking, um, you would still be building an underground lot on that piece of property, correct? Yes, that, that is correct. I, I imagine that is the that is the reason why Dom's decision was what it was. Um, and, and just for clarity, in that in that instance, I think I think Dom's decision is right. If the part I was asked, can the parking remain? Meaning, is the, the parking that's there can it remain? I think it could remain on that R one portion as is, but I it's likely the outcome that if they're redeveloping the parking and building the underground parking garage, then yeah, that's a redevelopment of the parcel and it needs to, would need to come into compliance. I'm sorry if I confused that. Yeah, I, I think that answers that question. Well, shall we still defer and uh, seek clarity from the current building inspector? Anybody give me direction? Glenn, do we, uh, can, can we just defer the uh, table this discussion to a future meeting? based on consensus or do we need any kind of formal vote? Mayor, I think well, there should be some direction given as to if the record was remaining open for written comment, what that would mean is for some period of time, people can send comments in to the city. We would take those comments, post them um, in, our, in our document center. But when you reconvene, that additional written comment could be considered, but there wouldn't be still an open public hearing where, you're, where you'd be able to ask questions of the applicant or questions of the public. So you, your record would be closed when that written record closes. So I think you wanna state a date at which the written record will close. And then we know the entire case is kind of submitted to the commissioners. Okay, thank you, you just complicated things. And now you're forcing me to pick a date, which I didn't wanna to have to do for the meeting date, but- You wouldn't have to pick a date for the meeting, Mayor. If, if you want to say the records left open till the close of business on the 25th, which is a week from today, it, it, then the records close and you can have the meeting at any time after, after that. It could be your next regular meeting if you wanted to. We might target, uh, that would work if we target the uh, first week in March. Uh, well, first or second weeks in March. Uh, the first week in March is probably better. The second week in March, we've got uh, three meetings right off the bat. So uh, if I target some dates in March, the first week, uh, then keeping it open another week, I think would be beneficial to anybody that listens to this uh, audio and video and uh, decides to uh, write in additional comments. So Glenn, can you think up a motion real quick that uh, indicates that the record would still be open for written comment uh, through uh, February 25th? It, or what do we need? Sure, so Mayor, the motion would be that that the um, public portion of the record be closed, but the record remain open for written comment until five o'clock on Friday, the 25th of February. And at that point, the record will be closed. Um, so, second. 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 So we have a motion by Edward Chernowski and a second by uh, Tony Sharp. Well, we'll use the wording coming from Glenn, but essentially it indicates that the public portion of the record will be closed, but the uh, record will be uh, left open for written comment through February 25th. Is that adequate, Glenn? That's, that's correct. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, if not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Hold your hand up as a yes. One, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, uh, and the uh, vote is unanimous to uh, uh, defer this meeting, uh, well, to uh, extend the public record till open till February 25th. Uh, and uh, so our path forward is somewhat settled. I need to come confer with Ann and find out open meeting dates uh, and establish a new uh, meeting time that is convenient to not just all the commissioners, but uh, city staff, city solicitor, uh, and the representatives of 330 Rehoboth Avenue. So I'll do that as quick as I can. Uh, is there any further comment uh, or Glenn, do you have any, or Commissioner Shinowski, do you have something? Yeah, I, I just want to confirm that when we notice that meeting, we will have the ability, you know, to go into executive session. We can do that, yes. Anything else, Glenn, anything else? Nothing further, Mayor. Thanks. All right. Hearing nothing else, then I'm going to uh, adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Representatives uh, Mr. Hutt and uh, Don uh, Lockwood, and for others participating, all those that spoke. We appreciate it. I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 3.50 p.m. Thank you. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Is anybody going to catch me? No, we're stopping the public hearing portion, and we still have more meeting to do. <laughs> I'm like, thank God, I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll, we'll take a brief pause to uh, say goodbye to Mr. Hutt and Don Lockwood. And uh, give me uh, uh, a few seconds to regroup here. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hutt, Mr. Lockwood. Ooh, we were almost going to be home for dinner time. Let's see what happens next. Uh, we're going to be moving on to uh, old business. Um, for old business, we're going to consider appointments to the new stormwater utility task force. Uh, you'll see that there is a support document uh, embedded in the agenda. And I just want to review it real quickly in that uh, this is uh, making appointments to the new stormwater utility task force. I want to remind everybody that all the applicants, but for one, qualify for membership as voting members by being either a resident or a property owner or a business owner or a business representative. Uh, the one uh, outlier is uh, Joseph Vescio. He lives out of town, so he's not a property or business owner, nor is he a business representative, but he does qualify for membership as a non-voting member because of his specialized expertise, uh, in my opinion. Uh, he is a former FEMA consultant, and he's had a career with the U.S. Environment Protection Agency. So I would be looking for a motion to approve the, the slate of 13 uh, applicants uh, that uh, we've talked about before in alphabetical order. This slate includes Elise Burns, Thomas Childers, Frank Cooper, Leticia Gomez, Suzanne Good, Jane Connessy, Janice Miller, Mary Peck, Eric Seward, Susan Stewart, Bob Suppies, Joseph Vescio, and Bruce Williams. Is there a motion to approve that slate? Move to approve. Second. second. By Commissioner Sharp and a second by Commissioner uh, Gay to approve the 13 members of the slate I just read. Is there any discussion? Uh, we'll go to members of the public real quick. Uh, anybody? Uh, I don't have my list here. Carol Everhart. I'm doing this from memory. Let's see, here it is. Here it is, Carol, Carol's off. Uh, uh, Mr. Sarah Bastava, I assume, is uh, was on for the 330 Rehoboth. Suzanne Good, any comments on the uh, formation of the Stormwater Utility Task Force of which you are a nominee? Uh, oh, thank you um, for including as many uh, parties as uh, you can. I think it will give a broader outcome to uh, how we decide to 
impose what looks to be very significant storm weather impact fees. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Walter Brigham. Thank you. Nothing, thank you. Uh, Dr. Trejos, anything on the stormwater utility uh, formation? Uh, no comment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and John Dewey? Actually, I think John uh, John dropped off, I think. So uh, uh, with that, we have a motion and a second to approve the slate of 13 uh, applicants as uh, the first set of new members uh, to the Stormwater Utility Task Force. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Hold your hand up to represent aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and with that, the uh, Stormwater Utility Task Force is uh, unanimously uh, uh, approves uh, 13 new nominees. Thank you very much. Uh, the next step is that uh, sometime in the near future, the uh, uh, new applicants or new members of that uh, task force will receive communication from the city uh, trying to establish a uh, meeting schedule. Thank you and congratulations to everybody. Uh, with that, we're gonna go to the next item of uh, old business, which is consider a one appointment to the Boardwalk and Beach Committee to fill the unexpired term of Libby Stiff. Commissioner uh, Jay Legree, take it, take it from there, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to nominate Howard Menneker. Howard is active in city affairs. He has a deep background in city affairs. He's been interested in the Boardwalk for a long time. And uh, uh, I welcome him. I would welcome him on the, the committee if if the uh, commissioners and the mayor so approve. Thank you, uh, thank you. Well, you're the chair, you're nominating. Uh, would somebody make a motion to approve uh, uh, Howard Maneker as uh, for membership on the Boardwalk and Beach Committee, period. I'll, I'll make that motion to appoint Howard Maneker to the Boardwalk and Beach Committee. Second. second. We have a motion by Commissioner Gay and a second by uh, Commissioner Chernowski to uh, nominate or approve the uh, nomination of Howard Maneker for membership uh, on the Boardwalk and Beach Committee to fill the uh, unexpired term of Libby Stiff. Uh, are there any further discussion? Uh, any discussion by members of the public? Uh, we'll, again, we'll be very quick. Uh, Suzanne Good. And it's acceptable to no, say pass. pass or no, yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> pass or no comment. Thank you. Pass, pass. Thank you. Walter Brittingham. Good selection. All right, uh, Dr. Trejos. No comment. And John Dewey uh, is still gone, I think. Very good. Uh, and with that, will um, uh, all those in favor of uh, Howard Menneker being appointed to the unexpired term of Libby Stiff on the Beach and Boardwalk Committee signify by saying aye, hold your hand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Howard uh, Menneker is uh, approved unanimously. Perhaps one of, uh, one of us can uh, inform him uh, of his uh, new role in the city. Thank you very much. You, uh, with that, I'd like to just take a very, very quick pause and uh, indicate that uh, we are currently soliciting applicants for membership on the Street and Transportation Committee and on the Environment Committee. Are there any others needed uh, to be filled? Uh, hearing none, I just want to say, uh, if you're interested, uh, contact the committee chairs for more information. You can also go online to see a description of the committee makeup and the mission. Applications are available online. And don't forget, we do accept uh, applications year round, not just when we're soliciting. So uh, put your application in there so we know that what you have interest in uh, and we can keep you in mind for uh, filling future vacancies. Uh, with that, we'll go to the next item of old business, which is to consider an ordinance to amend chapter 215 restaurants, section 215-5A, relating to time constraints for scheduling restaurant permit of compliance hearings. Uh, I'm gonna let, um, uh, Glenn, if you would just read, I, I, I think if you just read the synopsis, we should be fine there. The synopsis of this ordinance says, this ordinance amends section 215-5A of the Municipal Code of the City of Redwood Beach to require that in order for a permit of compliance public hearing to be conducted at a regular or special meeting of the commissioners, a permit of compliance application must be submitted more than 30 days 
in advance of such meeting. The current code says 25 days. And for reasons the city secretary can describe better because she's doing the noticing and everything, 30 days makes more sense. And I think my recollection is that this was supposed to have been passed with a different package of ordinances years ago and never made it into the code. So this is kind of a cleanup. And I'm going to come to you next, but Glenn, I'm going to confirm you're right. We did look it up. It was on the agenda multiple times. And for some reason, it never got voted on. And yet the other associated ordinances were voted on. So Ann brought this up. Ann, do you want to explain the difficulties in maintaining a 25-day turnaround versus 30 days relative to the media, I think? Sure. Currently, with the newspapers that I deal with for publishing, they've got deadlines. And one of the deadlines of the newspapers is a week out for publishing. And if it's 25 days when an application comes in, I have to have at least 22 days prior to a meeting to be able to put the ad together, get it to the newspapers in order for it to be published at least 15 days prior to the meeting. That does not really allow enough time also for the building inspector to do a quick review to let me know whether the application moves forward or not. And this occurred back in 2016 when it was originally brought to the commissioners. And like it was said previously, it had never made its way to actually getting adopted in an ordinance. It had gone through a workshop meeting, but for some reason, I can't tell you why it was never pushed through. Thank you. And any questions of Ann? So I'll be looking for is a motion to amend Chapter 215 Restaurants, Section 215-5A relating to restaurant permits of compliance, specifically changing the time constraint from 25 to 30 days. Can I have that motion, please? So moved. Second. Patrick, did you second it? Oh, he waved a second. So we've got a motion by Commissioner Ed Chernowski and a second by Commissioner Patrick Gossett to amend Ordinance 215-5A relating to restaurant permits of compliance, specifically changing the time constraint from 25 to 30 days. Is there any additional discussion? We'll go to members of the public. Carol, I think, had to drop off. Correct. She dropped off. Suzanne Good, any comments? This seems like a good idea. 30 days seems cleaner than 25. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Walter Brittingham? No comment. Thank you, Walter. No comment. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Trejos? Yes, no opposition and no further comment. Very good. Thank you, Doctor. With that, I want to call the question. The motion on the floor is to essentially change from 25 to 30 days the time constraints as articulated. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Hold your hand up to signify aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to go to the last item of last item of old business, which is a discussion and consideration of next steps in advancing the Wilmington Baltimore Avenue streetscape project. My desire here is to take one or two votes on there so that we're committing ourselves or to go forward or not. I would like one vote specifically on whether we're going to pause the project. If anybody decides that they think that it should just be paused, there's too much on their plate, here's the opportunity. The other option, of course, is to pursue it. And then if we vote favorably to pursue it, which pursue does not mean 100% commitment, it just means continue on the next steps, which would be 
uh, additional analysis of phasing and uh, additional analysis of funding, et cetera. Uh, but if we go uh, move favorably to pursue it, then one of the next things we need to decide also today is uh, the extent, if any, of undergrounding. So I'd like to first uh, open it up for uh, any discussion or comment on the project. Uh, and I'd really like it to culminate in a motion to uh, uh, pursue and move, move forward, advance, however you want to word it, uh, the Wilmington Baltimore Avenue Streetscape Project. Uh, Commissioner Legree. My question concerns funding and I'm not knowledgeable on, on the particulars of the, of the funding. I know we are, we've been talking about uh, help, partial help from the state. I think I've heard, I've heard a couple different uh, grants or shares. Uh, what is the status of that? Is that mayor a, you task force folks probably know, is that a, is there a window on that funding? Do we, run the chance of losing it forever? Or do we run the chance of losing what we uh, currently have worked out? I mean, I just, that's a big thing for me. If we're gonna, if we're gonna lose the ability to, to, to get extra funds, that, would, that puts a different light on it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Sharon, but uh, my personal feeling is that we've got momentum going uh, and I'm afraid that if we lose that momentum, uh, then those dollars that uh, Del Dot has, as far as the Transportation uh, Act or whatever it is, uh, is going to go elsewhere. And it may be hard to get them back in the future. Uh, but uh, Sharon, do you or Kevin want to uh, uh, give your perspective, please? Mayor, I'll just say that uh, I know Del Dot is anxiously waiting uh, us to the city to move forward. So. I, I, there is no specific time frame, but uh, all I can say is Del Dot is waiting. They haven't given us a uh, specific time. I doubt that they would want to, you know, wait too long. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cernowski, please. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, Sharon or, or Evan, um, have we identified other um, sources of, of revenue, um, whether it be grants or, um, uh, well, before you answer, Sharon, I'll tell you, I, I have always been cautious about naming specific sources of grants because all of my other municipal colleagues, uh, want to go to the same sources. Yeah. So <laughs> be cautious is what you said. That, that's, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, Kevin and I and Sharon have all, you know, presented to you the, the idea of having a project manager come on board and help us identify the phasing of how the streetscape project would play out. And one of the things contained within that scope would be uh, a funding plan. So assisting us with identifying those grants, uh, coordinating those grants, uh, and assisting again with the financial aspect of that. So I think a lot of that information is still to come. We're certainly aware of some sources right now, uh, but I think more information would be provided once we proceed with a project manager. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Legree, your hand's still up. Yes, sir. Uh, I counted 28 million on the, on the CIP uh, schedule that had been, had been presented we're having, we're going to have some significant challenges in the immediate future. I know that 3B of the upgrades is probably okay. We, we still have that money left in there from the revolving, uh, from the loan. But we're going to have to probably look at 12 million for the phase four. And of that, probably six or seven million will be our share. So we have some real challenges in the next 24, 25, 26 time frame. Uh, on the other hand, the the task the, the Wilmington Vault upgrades are are significant. You'd hate to lose those just because you didn't act in, on on gaining the funds. So 
I'm sitting here having a dilemma trying to trying to think about it, but uh, yeah, that's that's where I am right now. And right. We'll yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, yeah, my Under what I'm trying what I'm trying to do is is uh, take a vote so that we can quantify how many people want to move forward or not. My desire in moving forward, obviously I'm for moving forward, uh, but I also recognize that uh, at any time we could put a stop to it. It could be that uh, the $7 million a year uh, gets divided in half and it becomes an eight year project. Again, we don't know until that analysis is done about phasing and, and extra funding. Uh, so there's always a possibility that we can stop it. But by having a favorable vote to proceed, for me, validates spending money on phasing and analysis, a city representative to do that, uh, as well as continuing to work with Del Dot and, and, and trying to push this forward. Uh, Commissioner Gossett, please. Yes, thank you. Um, based on the fact that we have authorized, a, as soon as we approve the budget, but a a uh, city project manager to help us assist the project in planning and in budgeting. I, I would like to make a motion that the city continue to pursue the Baltimore Wilmington streetscape uh, project and to continue to investigate the cost and the practicality of undergrounding vaults to the greatest extent possible. And, and then recognizing certainly that this may, it may be possible in one area and not in others or not at all, but I certainly think we should continue to pursue this project. Oh, thank second. you. So we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Gossett and a second by Commissioner Chernowski. Uh You heard it. I'm not going to repeat it because I didn't write it down. But essentially, uh, Patrick, it is to move forward with uh, the streetscape project, including uh, including additional investigation of undergrounding. Now, now, remember, our second part of our conversation will segue right into undergrounding there. But uh, uh, is there any further discussion on uh, Commissioner Gossett's uh, motion? Commissioner Legree? I support Commissioner uh, Gossett's uh, motion. And I'd like to say that uh, there may be there may be good possibilities to uh, to underground the utilities without having uh, extensive vaulting. Well, that's, uh, I don't want to cut you off. I do want to cut you off because that is our next conversation. We're, we're not there yet. I'm just responding to the motion, which included undergrounding. So you can take it from there. Mayor, just, just for clarification, uh, my motion in also included to investigate the cost and practicality of undergrounding vaults to the greatest extent possible meaning that there may be areas that it, it is a practical in all or not at all. But I think that just pursuing this and moving forward as, as the bulk here. All right, that would you mind would you mind reading your motion in entirety again and then we'll go to sure. the members of the public. That the city continue to pursue the Baltimore Wilmington streetscape and to continue to investigate the cost and practicality of undergrounding vaults to the greatest extent possible and to pursue undergrounding, utilizing fully undergrounded vaults to whole or partially throughout the project area. All right, we're gonna to go to the members of the, uh, I'm sorry, Susan, uh, Commissioner Gay, you have a comment? I just, so are we now probably doing just one motion for all of the issues then instead of doing two? I mean, well, it, it, it sounds good. like it, it sounds okay. like it, but for, but for me, I, I, you know, I need to have this second conversation. Uh, okay, fair enough, just uh, asking. But let's go to the members of the public there. Uh, Suzanne Good, do you have any comments, please? On, on uh, again, again, it's kind of confusing. Yes, on this. The desire, oh, sorry. the desire was a motion on whether to pursue or not, but it's a combined motion with undergrounding. And yet I'm a little frustrated because we haven't had that conversation on undergrounding yet. So anyhow, why don't you just give any and all comments on Streetscape? <laughs> Okay, you're you're ready, Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, um, you've actually uh, moved at warp speed just in the last seven to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So my main comments, as you know from I believe uh, your January 
for december is that given the known costs of the baltimore avenue restrooms and lifeguard station given the known cost of the pump station and all the wastewater treatment plant upgrades which are not discretionary in any way these are all well the restroom project has been approved and and like the Wilmington Avenue one, um, which I believe has incurred some additional costs due to hitting a water main. Um, those are sort of on the books. My main problem is the pr approach to it now. It seems to be almost a foregone conclusion. I guess there's a, a vocal majority who believe this is the right thing to do in, in the short term rather than postponing it. Uh, I believe there's already been money spent on um, consulting fees, in fact, a considerable amount on that. I'm very concerned about this undergrounding of utilities, given that I believe we already have that on Rehoboth Avenue in the event of flooding, which is a risk because it's close to the coast. We're sort of going to get too invested in, in utilities, which would be at uh, possibly destroyed altogether in the event of a, a large storm surge. But at this point, I feel like continuing to spend money on consulting fees and, and you're actually talking about a project manor, manager to assess all the options is only relevant if we for sure are going ahead with it, which I would advocate against because technology inevitably is going to change a lot in the next, let's say, three years costs will also escalate inevitably. So if we were to spend an additional 50000 or or $100,000 on more consulting, including a, a dedicated project manager, a lot of that money could be wasted because three years hence, it would have to be redone altogether. So I also con am concerned there's a mindset that there's pandemic funding, whether from Del Dot, the state, or the county, and various, I guess, federal sources, that somehow if we don't grab at it, it will be lost. I have a different experience with federal and state and local entities that they are willing to work with a municipality like ours. And this funding, it's probably a fixed amount they have in mind overall for Rehoboth Beach, can be applied to other infrastructure that we know we have to tackle. So let's take the example of uh, property taxes or even this uh, soon to be created stormwater impact fee that property owners will have to pay. We could have, those things wouldn't have to go up as much. And in the case of stormwater wouldn't have to be, the magnitude could be smaller if we don't have this almost $50 million project to fund over the next five to eight years. So I'm very concerned that we, we're sort of jumping the gun a little bit. You're not, you're not talking about whether this really is something we can afford and whether we want to continue to spend 50, 100,000, whatever it's going to be for a dedicated project manager. And um, if it turned, and because we've already done enough investigation, preliminary study to know the approximate cost. So I would appreciate your sort of putting the brakes a little bit on, on uh, whether we move forward, because otherwise it will be like a lot of projects in this city that essentially pressure tactics are used to, give dire warnings that this money will be gone if we don't grab it now. And I've never felt that argument was all, all that credible, actually. Um, a lot of these grants are fungible, so they can be uh, applied for for different projects. So I'd appreciate your Thank you, Susan. slowing things down a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Walter Brittingham, anything on... Uh... I'm trying to segregate. Uh, thank you. I, I do have a comment here. First of all, I, I like, like a question. Um, is Mr. Jim Smith, um, did, is he registered or did Mr. Mayor, did you have him preparing yes, he, a comment? He will, he, he, will, he, like? will be, he will be part of the, the second discussion on undergrounding. Okay. So we're at the first of the little circles. <laughs> yes. Okay, so it no. sounds like you're not discussing the whole thing before you start to vote on it. 
That's what it sounds like. Okay, I, I really do believe that, um, and, and I just got to tell you, uh, I'm an outside contractor to Delmarva, and I think Mr. Smith will tell you, for those of you that do not know that we do not buy our power, City of Rehoboth does not get their power from Delmarva Power, they mer merely deliver it, and in all respect to Suzanne's comments, we do not have underground on Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, we have some cabling underground, but the junction boxes and everything are both. But I'll leave um, the professional assessment to Mr. Jim Smith, who I respect and, and work with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, doc, Dr. Trejos, again, uh, you know, let, me, let me pause a minute. Commissioner Gossett, your, your motion is for two things, moving forward and also uh, dealing with undergrounding. Uh, I had, uh, through Kevin Williams, they invited uh, Jim Smith here to talk more about undergrounding and uh, Delmarva Power's uh, availability or willingness or not willingness to do undergrounding. And I think really it ought to, we ought to have that conversation before we vote on your motion, uh, but- uh, sure, uh, I'm fine with that. I didn't realize Mr. Smith was gonna be part of the conversation, but that's fine if you have additional information. But I think that's what we're trying to gather here is the, the fact that you know some uh, we, we've gotten uh, responses from Delmarva that they prefer not to do it or they don't practically do that in, in, in other communities and what have you. But I, I, I haven't, the way I've read the interpretation from Delmarva there's no flat out says we don't do this. Um, we prefer not to do it. We have no other ex uh, uh, no other equipment in the area that we do that. Um, so just a, a firm, we don't have the capabilities or the manpower or the talent to do it. That's fine. But I I, I don't you know if you want to uh, uh, do it in different blocks or something of that nature. So if you have additional information, that's fine. But I still feel that we should pursue this as was. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you were part of this also when we were uh, discussing the restoration or a streetscape of Rehoboth Avenue. If you don't have a shovel-ready project, there's no way to go go to the state or the feds for money. So I, I think uh, we well, get to that point. Well, please please don't construe my uh, what I'm saying. I I want my intention here was to conduct two votes: one just to pursue or pause, and then if we move forward, a second vote on the extent of undergrounding. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, we're in, I consider ourselves in the middle of discussion of uh, the motion that you made. Let's, let's move on, if you don't mind, to uh, the discussion of undergrounding, and that might give uh, you a little more clarity. So, uh, Commissioner Legree, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I really wanted to go this route first. Uh, if you recall, the uh, support document was uh, a letter from, uh, happened to be from Delmarva Power, uh, authored by Jim Smith. Uh, and uh, the way I interpreted it, as I uh, conveyed last time, was that they will not underground uh, using fully vaulted. Uh, they would certainly do uh, undergrounding uh, similar to mirror what uh, is done on Rehoboth Avenue. Uh, so Kevin Williams, uh, you want to introduce uh, Jim Smith and let's get some clarity from uh, Jim Smith on uh, the types of undergrounding that uh, Delmarva Power would be willing to facilitate for us. Sure. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jim's been before this board uh, many times, so I, I don't think he needs any further introduction than just uh, say, Jim, take it from there. Well, great. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, can you folks hear me? Yes, we see you out on the beach there, surf fishing. That's just my virtual way of saying I'm ready for warmer weather and going for some walks on your boardwalk. So, well, thanks a lot for um, having me here. I, I do appreciate it. And uh, we certainly appreciate the long standing relationship that uh, Delmarva has enjoyed for many years with the city of Rehoboth and notably working with us on a lot of electric reliability improvements uh, that we've been making in the city and the surrounding area to prove to improve electric service. So thank you for working with us. And, you know, you know, the modernization of the grid that we've been doing over the last decade has, has uh, really improved reliability for our customers in Rehoboth. We've seen probably a 35, 40% uh, decrease in power outages over the last five years uh, through those upgrades. And so let me segue to the, you know, the, the analysis that you folks are doing, you know, with your streetscape project. 
Um, you know, as you evaluate, you know, doing this on Baltimore and Wilmington Avenues, uh, we really appreciate you involving us early on in the process. I think it was probably a year or so ago we got some of the first, um, maybe not that long ago, but got some of the first questions about undergrounding in general and, you know, what would be, you know, required. And uh, I think your consultant did a, a, a very good job in portraying the scope of Delmarva Power and the other utilities work and what would be required during a conversion from an aerial uh, to, to underground uh, infrastructure. And, and so with what you said, I watched, I've watched several of your recent virtual meetings and, and just want to thank you for the opportunity to provide some clarity as it relates to placing our electrical distribution equipment underground. Um, and, and you saw some of the talking points and I just want to hit some of the high points of that and, and some of the key messages. And so, you know, as you look at the characteristics of our service territory, it's obvious that we're surrounded by water, including Rehoboth and the coastal region of Delaware, Maryland, where we operate our system. Uh, the current aerial system, along with pad mounted infrastructure, has historically operated in a very safe, reliable and cost effective manner. Uh, and other than a small downtown portion of the city of Wilmington, the Delmarva Power Service Territory is served by both aerial and underground pad mounted infrastructure. And when we say pad mounted underground equipment, we're basically talking about lines that are buried, uh, but then they are interconnected within enclosures or as most of our customers call them the green boxes, like what you see with the Rehoboth Avenue uh, streetscape from about 15 years ago when we converted the overhead poles and wires to a pad mounted system. And we've done similar streetscape projects uh, in Bethany, and we have done uh, a varying degree of that down in uh, the downtown areas of Ocean City to, to pad mount it. And so when we talk about pad mounted uh, undergrounding versus vaulted, um, there is a, there's a difference and there's a big difference. And I think during the course of your discussions and the analysis that you did, there seemed to be a perception that there could be a choice uh, when it came to that. And, and, the, and the truth is there really isn't because we operate uh, our underground through pad mounted infrastructure. And so for any aerial to underground conversion, we're certainly a, a willing partner to work with you on this streetscape project. But any type of underground conversion that we would do, not only in Rehoboth, but in other areas of our service territory in Delaware and the eastern shore of Maryland, the underground system would be pad mounted, meaning there would be those above ground green boxes or enclosures. And let me just expand on a little bit why we operate our system like that. Uh, vaulted or totally underground systems are certainly utilized in our industry. However, they're generally located in, in, in high density urban areas, notably, you know, the downtown areas of cities where most, if not all the utilities are in vaults. And that would include electrical equipment, which typically would be found otherwise on a, on, on a overhead utility pole, such as transformers, switches, regulators, things like that. Operationally, the best practice for Delmarva Power in this area is to serve its customers with pad mounted electrical equipment. Uh, vaulting a small portion of our service territory to um, facilitate an enhancement, an, an aesthetic enhancement project just wouldn't be efficient or cost effective. And it really could actually jeopardize electric service reliability for our customers. And again, you typically only see that in, in, in more urban or downtown city areas. And we only have a sliver of our service territory in, in the downtown Wilmington area where that is operated. Uh, vaulted and fully underground systems um, they in, in this area just would not be cost and uh, it, it just would be very cost and maintenance prohibitive to, to do something like that. Uh, vaults have a significant underground imprint to accommodate safe work and maintenance and outage restoration. Um, they require expensive and very intricate pumping systems and extensive maintenance practices that would be required. And the current Delmarva power infrastructure that serves Rehoboth and the surrounding area is very accessible to operate for maintenance. And in particular, when we do have a power interruption, like during a storm, and, you know, that balance of overhead poles and wires with the pad mounted equipment has served us very well. Uh, furthermore, the vaulted underground systems have uh, separate safety and operational and reliability protocols requiring line personnel with 
specific skill sets uh, to, to operate and maintain that infrastructure, which we do not have in this area. They're typically in metropolitan areas. And in fact, I think, you know, one of the ironies is in over the last decade, uh, we have been investing heavily in some of our low-lying areas to actually raise pad mounted equipment, uh, to put them on taller box pads to help alleviate uh, flooding damage and, and, and issues that we've had with outages in those low-lying areas. And, and some of our notable outage and maintenance challenges in this region are in flood-prone areas where underground lines and pad mounted transformers can get inundated with water and, and salt contamination. So the low water table is, you know, obviously something that uh, prohibits us from considering vaulted infrastructure being that close to the ocean and the back bays. And when you look at the corrosive uh, saltwater intrusion and the complexity of, of op operating that type of system and the cost, not only of installing it, but then the long-term maintenance uh, of that. Um, and, and to give you an idea too, we actually, um, uh, to give you maybe a couple of testimonials, we um, we talked to one of our sister companies, Atlantic City Electric, um, that really has a very similar service territory as we do. They serve the oceanfront areas. They serve back bays. In between, they have a lot of small towns and, and, and even rural farm areas. And so it's very geographically very similar to ours. And at one point, they did some vaulting in the Atlantic City area. And when talking to, you know, our, our, our cohorts there, you know, they, uh, they have abandoned that uh, simply because of the challenges associated with power restoration, the complexity of the equipment, uh, the issues with operating the equipment safely, and, and certainly the water uh, infiltration. Um, another thing I do want to share, and then I can certainly open it up to questions, and uh, in watching one of your more recent uh, commissioner meetings, I noted that Mr. Brittingham um, did adeptly point out that Delmarva Power did attempt uh, many years ago uh, an underground vault approach in country club estates. Um, and when that community was first uh, developed back in the 60s and early 70s, it was an era when many electric utilities were undergrounding uh, plan developments in communities. And at that time, uh, we were doing the, the vast majority, almost all of it was pad mounted, but there was a pilot project done in country club estates to actually install below ground equipment, including the transformers and switch modules in underground vaults throughout that neighborhood. And for those of you that either live in country club estates or are, very, are familiar with it, we had to go in and replace all of the uh, electric cable in country club estates about 15 years ago, which is about a normal time frame to, you know, once the cable starts, you know, outliving its useful life. Uh, but when we went in to replace the cable, um, you know, one of the first things that was evaluated was the performance of those submersible pieces of equipment that were in vaults. And it was interesting. We did a presentation before the HOA and actually before the city. Uh, I dug up that presentation from 2005 and we literally outlined some of the factors of why we were going to convert that to a pad mounted system rather than the submersible system. And uh, we talked to employees who had worked on the equipment and, and engineers who had, had, had worked closely with it. And there were just numerous issues from a safety standpoint, um, as far as our employees uh, safely accessing that equipment. Um, the, there was constant maintenance uh, from water infiltration to debris and, and, and other different types of hazards. Uh, the reliability factors were really the biggest things. The outage duration and switching times in country club estates when we had a vaulted system, uh, some of the outage times uh, were double, if not triple, the amount of time of other areas because of the access to the vaulted infrastructure rather than pad-mounted infrastructure, which can be easily accessed, flipped up, and, and, and our crews can get to it. Um, and so, you know, having that unobstructed access is much better to, to, to go at the equipment with the green boxes or the enclosure. So I hope that gives you a little bit of idea of, of, of why we do it. It's, uh, it wasn't, it, it's not a decision, uh, you know, that was made on a whim that we just don't do it. it. There's a lot of thought that's gone into that, and it really is an operational uh, best practice uh, for us in, in, in this area. So I'd be glad to open it up to to any questions that you uh, you folks might have. And again, thank you for having us here today. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, Jim. We appreciate it. Uh, and if you'd hang around for a little while, we'll see if uh, 
Anybody has any questions or you can follow along the conversation? Uh, Commissioner Legree? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the music man. Believe what I'm telling you. Don't believe your lying eyes. And as I look up, I see a junkyard overhead. And that's my, that's my biggest problem with overhead utilities. You look down Queen Street or Prospect or any street that I live around and you see transformers hanging off of poles. You see wires going everywhere. Uh, it's just a horrible aesthetic junkyard in the sky. And my main objective is to get rid of that unsightly overhead junkyard. Number two, Every time you put in new poles, they're taller. Uh, I'm thinking of King Charles right now, but any of the entrances coming into the city are, the poles get taller and taller. And the cable, it's thicker and thicker. And uh, I think that's probably not even uh, uh, electric delivery cables, most of that stuff that that is new. I think it's uh, fiber optics and and backhauling, but I know you're interested in the bottom line, but we're interested in the way our town looks. Uh, we want to be an we want to have an urban canopy, and our trees are wherever they're around power lines. The power lines have to be have to be free, and that means that somebody we think it might be Delmarva Power whoever they hire or whatever, or maybe they do themselves, come in and, and, and rape our trees to make room for the power lines. And that's understandable because the power lines can't be obstructed. So I think you see my, my point. And uh, I didn't know you were coming to speak today. I would have, I would have looked, in, uh, uh, looked up some more information. I know Florida Power and Light undergrounds as much as their uh, electricity as they can <clears throat> with their transmission lines, but certainly their residential lines. And uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna have antennas on every other corner one of these days, and they're gonna be using your poles or gosh knows how. <clears throat> and, and we're gonna have a, a mess, we're gonna have chaos. And undergrounding is my personal thought about uh, a solution to that problem. Hemlope and Acres has managed to do it. Country Club Estates has managed to do it. You see other towns that have managed to uh, underground their, their utility lines or at least keep all but decorative poles off of their streets. And that's where I'm coming from. Mayor, you had hired, I thought, another consultant who talked about undergrounding. Thank you very much, Jim. I, I appreciate your coming here. You knew what you were going to face, and, uh, and you're brave. Thanks again. Well, thank you, well, thank you Commissioner Legree. Um, you know, if, if you look at the agenda, I had hoped to anticipate, uh, of course, the first vote on pursuing the project, and then if we move forward, determine the status of undergrounding facilities. Uh, we know from the Wilmington Baltimore Avenue Streetscape Task Force that the priority, number one priority was the underground. Uh, and on the agenda, I give three avenues. One is to abandon pursuit of undergrounding. If we found it was just too complicated, too expensive, if it was gonna delay it too long, then we have that possible route forward just to abandon it. But we've got two other options also. One is to pursue undergrounding, utilize, I say above ground transformers, uh, Jim's terminology, it's uh, using underground, uh, pad mounted uh, uh, undergrounding. Uh, that to me reflects exactly what the Rohoit Avenue streetscape undergrounding is. We got rid of all the telephone poles and aerial wires on Rohoit Avenue, but we replaced them with uh, undergrounded buried wires that, that meet in, in uh, pad mounted above ground junction boxes. Uh, and to me, uh, Jim hadn't said that we can't do that. I think that is very viable. What Jim, I heard Jim say is the third bubble is pursue undergrounding, utilizing fully 
underground and vaulting so that there's nothing uh, above ground. The pad mounted uh, uh, exclosures or enclosures or junction boxes are fully under the ground. That's what I heard him say uh, is not feasible and that they will not do. Uh, and uh, so maybe we need clarification there, but uh, I'm, all, I'm, I'm with you, Commissioner Legree, that the project is almost not worth doing if we can't get rid of the telephone poles and the aerials. But again, as I see it, there is an avenue forward uh, and it's just not fully undergrounding. Um, Commissioner Chernowski and then per, uh, Commissioner Gossett. Uh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Smith, is it, um, so I think what you've stated is in the outside of a small area in Wilmington, you do not, Del Mar Power does not have any of the underground vaults. Is that correct? No, we do not operate a vaulted system anywhere other than the, the downtown business area of Wilmington. Everything else is the above ground enclosures, the green boxes. Yes. So, in, and it sounds like 15 years ago, you, um, whatever underground vaulted system in country club estate, um, you have, um, you've gotten rid of those and are just using the pad mounted in, in there? That's exactly right. Yeah, we shifted to above ground infrastructure. Yep. Okay, so it, I, I think what the, the mayor heard is, is what I heard, and I just want you to confirm. Delmarva Power will not, cannot do underground submerged vaults. Is that, is that, that fair? That, that's correct. Yeah. Any undergrounding that we would do would be like Rehoboth Avenue, where we have the above ground enclosures with underground, you know, wire. It, uh, thanks for that clarification. So, yep. Mayor, I mean, it doesn't sound like we've got we've got much of a choice here. It's it's option A or B at this point. There there is no C. Um, I, my my concern with um, I I agree. I want to get rid of I want to get rid of the wires in the sky. But my concern is on, on Baltimore and Wilmington, they're, they're very much unlike Rehoboth Avenue. They don't have a median. They, don't have, they didn't already have wide sidewalks. Um, I, 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 I think it may be challenging to find appropriate spots to have those padlock boxes um, on those streets. Um, I still want to move forward and I still want to pursue it, but um, I, I think that's going to be difficult on those, on those streets. Um, that, that's why I was hoping that completely undergrounding uh, was the answer. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Gossett, please. Um, you know, I, if you want me to withdraw my motion and, and uh, now that you explain what, how you've landed on the agenda, I, I can withdraw the motion and make it a separate motion uh, to pursue. And then you can move forward with undergrounding or what have you wish to. Uh, I think that would be appropriate, but I don't know the correct mm. Robert's rules. Do we need the person seconding it to withdraw it and then you correct. withdraw it? That's who, right. Who seconded it? Um, I think I did. Yes. I, I, would, I withdraw the second of the motion. Okay. And, and then... Patrick, if you would withdraw your motion. Um, we'll motion and make a new motion, and the new motion would be the city continue to pursue the Baltimore-Wilmington streetscape um, moving forward. And, and do you want to include uh, include anything about undergrounding or just? <laughs> I, I did that before and you didn't like it, so let's go with the, with the first one. Well, I thought I thought your first motion had to do with fully vaulted. You know, I mean, I, I, fr frankly, because we've just learned that fully vaulted is not doable, I think your motion is adequate because we know moving forward we're going to pursue uh, undergrounding, what, what, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, I think it ought to be to move forward and uh, pursue undergrounding, utilizing the pad mounted uh, underground system or something. Let me just, I'm not making a motion. Let me just clarify the language and I may make a motion and it was the first motion, okay? Okay, okay. Are we ready? Okay. okay. It was the city to continue to pursue the Baltimore Wilmington streetscape and to continue to investigate the cost and the practicality of undergrounding vaults to the greatest extent possible. That doesn't mean that 
It, it uh, recognizes it may not be possible in some areas or in all areas, but I think we should investigate it. Period. I think that's a good. Write that down and- uh, Isn't that the first motion? That was my first motion, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I, so I swear I thought the first motion had to do with fully vaulted. So I, I apologize if I stop things, but I think we need to have a squiggle room. I thought we had to have this conversation. So I appreciate it. There's nobody else that uh, has their hand up. Do you want to go ahead and make that now as a form? Well, Commissioner Sharp, uh, go ahead. Mayor, just quickly, could you clarify when the, when the Baltimore Wilmington Task Force was taking all this under advisement. And I'm sure they talked about the pad mounted or the green boxes. What was their position on pad mounted and green boxes? Commissioner Sarnowski might need to help me. I don't recall the Wilmington Baltimore Avenue Streetscape Task Force taking a position on one over the other. That okay. When we originally talked about it, we did say that, that a priority or the priority, number one priority, was the underground. And I think that's as far as the extent went until uh, citizen Mike Strain brought up uh, that we should be doing fully vaulted. And then maybe maybe Dr. Trejos uh, can explain if, if he also brought it up also. Uh, and, but I don't recall a a def definitive debate on which, which route we should go. Uh, do you, Commissioner Cernowski? No, Mayor, we, we didn't discuss it in great detail, just that we wanted to pursue undergrounding. At that point, we knew that a, uh, a third party consultant would need to be engaged to provide more details. Uh, so we didn't really talk about it much in detail. We didn't have the details to, to talk about. All right. Thank you. So let's entertain a motion and then uh, we'll uh, go to the members of the public uh, and then uh, take a vote. Commissioner uh, uh, Gossett, you wanna try again, please? Okay. I'd like to make a motion that city continue to pursue the Baltimore Wilmington streetscape and to continue to investigate the cost and the practicality of underground vaults to the greatest extent possible. This recognizes it may not be possible in some or all areas. A second, or, or I agree to the friendly amendment to the motion, however it was phrased. All right, so we've got a motion by Commissioner Patrick Gossett, and a second by Commissioner Chernowski, essentially saying that uh, uh, the city will continue to pursue uh, Wilmington Baltimore Streetscape uh, project. Uh, I can't read the rest of my notes. Uh, let, let's, uh, we'll have Patrick repeat it before we vote. Let's go to the members of the public uh, next, uh, if we don't mind. Uh, or do you want to go first, Commissioner Legree? I want to reinstate the comment that I made uh, when Patrick made his first motion. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to the members of the public and we'll come back to the, uh, Dr. Uh, Trejos, would you like to start off? Thank you, Mayor, yes, I would. Uh, first, I would like to uh, put full support behind this motion by, uh, for, by Commissioner Gossett. Uh, I am totally supportive of that. For, for full disclosure, uh, it should be known that I am uh, a property owner uh, on Wilmington Avenue and the boardwalk, along with uh, Rehoboth Avenue, North First Street and South First Street. So there is a uh, ownership interest that I have in this matter. But I wish to begin by saying that the whole concept of underground vaulting is actually dovetailed by uh, Mr. Smith of Delmarva when he made the comment that, quote, vaults predominantly are being done in downtown business districts in the city. Well, let's not forget that Wilmington Avenue is a business district. It is not really a residential district. And we need to keep that in perspective. Baltimore Avenue, for the most part, has commercial district. Uh, and so when we talk about doing vaulting in residential areas, that might be fine. But one of the main reasons why they do vaulting in commercial districts, especially in cities, is to prevent the uh, above ground of uh, padded transformers from, quote, obstructing significant commercial uh, entities. We need to remember that uh, if, if we use my our properties that I own in Rehoboth, 
where it is da uh, uh, where it is the uh, David Skippy's was now going to be uh, Zog's uh, 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 Bar and Grill and uh, Zog's uh, sh Rum Shack. We have to remember that one of the main transformers right there is located right in front of David's, uh, right in front of the opening to Zog's. One of the proposals on the original uh, plans was to put a pad mounted transformer right in front of the opening of Dave and Skippy's and in front of Zog's. That would be a, a, a horrific thing to put in such a mounted transformer, and you know how big those things are, on a bump out in front of that location. Uh, don't, we also don't need to forget that I had originally uh, uh, made a comment. Uh, I had made a presentation, some of you may recall, uh, back at uh, the Wilmington Baltimore Area Task Force that was on the uh, date, I believe it was uh, uh, August 4th of 2021, where I made a presentation with regard to the potential flooding area on Wilmington Avenue. And now the discussion is being made by Delmarva of raising the pads even higher in order to account for that potential flooding. Understood. But how high are these transformers going to become and become totally obstructive to the businesses on both Wilmington Avenue and Delaware Avenue? Therefore, if we're going to be doing any sort of above ground padded transformers, which I can predict are going to be significantly higher than just being at street level, we have to strategically place them so that they do not in any way, shape or form cause major obstruction to the businesses. In, my, in using the example that I'm speaking of here, instead of placing the pad uh, again in front of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Zog's Bar and Grill, uh, it, would, it would be better placed at the very southeast corner of lot three uh, adjacent to the very furthest southwest corner of uh, lot one, which is basically where the uh, emergency fire egress for emergency to be used in order to not create that type of obstruction to businesses. Now, that's just my example. It's countless examples going down the entire street of Wilmington Avenue. And you're going to have to deal with all the businesses there if we're going to do this above ground padded to make sure that those businesses are not obstructed by these significant above ground padded transformers. Uh, so again, that follows uh, Commissioner Tranowski's uh, comment about the location of the bump outs and all this has to be taken into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Trejos. Uh, I think your uh, cautionary notes are, are, are appropriate, but I also wanna remind everybody that uh, none of the locations illustrated on any of those documents are, are, are either accurate or intended to be accurate. Uh, they have, uh, in fact, have disclaimers on those pages that say these are just there to be there, they're, that, they, that there needs to be further analysis, uh, et cetera. So that they show something in front of Zogs is, is meaningless. Uh, you have a good point, though, that nobody wants them in front of their places. But uh, again, you can't, in my view, you can't look at any of the Rossi concept plans and say that's definitively is where an underground. That's why we hired a JMT, and that's why we actually need to uh, do further analysis and uh, development of that program. Uh, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Trejos. Uh, Commissioner Legree and then Commissioner Shranowski. Could, could I ask Dr. Trejos a question, sure. Mayor? Sure. Dr. Trejos, do you think you could, people could become creative and find, and find locations for these uh, pad mounted transformers that would be, that would be suitable? Uh, 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 suggestions. Uh, you know, uh, again, Commissioner Legree, uh, that is exact, exactly what I just gave an example of, uh, where you can strategically locate this. Why did I pick the location that I just did as an example? We know that the Bellhaven Hotel is going to be constructed. The Bellhaven Hotel's main and, uh, in, and e entrance and egress is going to be located at their very southeast corner of lot three. Our furthest portion of the southwest corner of lot one, where David Skippy's watch was now going to be the Zog's Raw Bar, 
is where we also have the uh, e entrance egress for the fire egress out of the back part of Zogs. That would be the best location for a bump out for a pad because that way it in no way obstructs any sort of a business but is located strategically where it would not be obtrusive or obstructive or anything like that and would be perfectly fit. It really requires uh, property owners to be diligently involved with this entire matter so that we in turn can provide input as to where the best locations could be for these bump outs, Commissioner Legree. And then just on a, on a very side closing note, uh, you may recall that I had you know, sent an email to you with regard to uh, infrastructure. And again, we, I just will make a comment that any sort of undergrounding that we do must also take into account future development, as you just mentioned earlier about 5G, 6G, we have to take into account adequate uh, under, uh, under uh, additional capacity in the future. So I don't wanna be seeing the streets torn up, busted up every so many months or every so many years, we need to take all this into consideration for the future. Thank you, Dr. Treos. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cernowski, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Why don't you finish public comment and, and then I'll go. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Walter Brittingham, please. Okay, um, I'll keep this very short. I'll tell you what happened on Rehoboth Avenue. Delmarva, uh, the contractors extended conduits to every property because the house that was there today might not be there tomorrow. So did the phone company. So when you put your lines underground so to stop the problem of tearing your streets up, that the path to each one of those properties is there. You can also send them into transformer rooms in there. Uh, the right way to do it is get your cables underground, have your transformers and your switches above ground. You, a lot of people don't think a thing about it, but a lot of times the power pole is not in front of the front door of buildings. It's at the corners of the properties between the properties. Um, but it can be made to look nice. And typically other, I can't imagine that there would be a problem of having transformers pad mounted on Baltimore and Wilmington Avenue. It could still look nice with planning on some bump outs, no different than you have on Rehoboth Avenue that you have bump outs where people have proposed to have, um, be able to serve coffee and stuff like that, or whether you put a bicycle thing on it. But undergrounding the cables is fine, but pad mounting the transformers and switches is done regularly. And Del Marva's not would not do this work. It would be done by a contractor. JMT did it beforehand, and Del Marva Power just came in and put their equipment on the end of it. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Suzanne Good, are you talked out, or would you like to offer more? Of that. Okay, I just got the notification that I've been unmuted. No, I, I won't take as much time as commercial property owner Dr. Trejos did, but I do have uh, quite a bit to add. I would like to thank uh, consultant Mr. Smith um, in that surf fishing background anyway, uh, but I, I wish we had had him speak at length uh, earlier on in this discussion, because I'm wondering if, if Country Club Estate becomes a cautionary tale because it was corrosion by the salt air a factor in the lower than expected um, life, well, life expectancy or the lower than expected time frame that those cables lasted. That's, I think it's critical to, to learn whether the, the salt air here um, compared to say Wilmington, where Mr. Smith has, has referenced, um, that yeah, in any major city, Washington, DC, Philadelphia, that's the norm in, in, in downtown business districts. I'm very concerned. Um, I've been concerned for a while at the significant number of parking spaces, which get lost and, and which no longer exist on either Baltimore or Wilmington avenues 
based on the designs I've seen uh, that the task force or the committee proposed, because these are areas that have an acute shortage of parking already. So the, not just the the inconvenience to visitors, but just the sheer congestion that this may lead to. I know they're they're doing better turnaround options, which uh, I know people backing up on either Wilming on both Baltimore, especially on Baltimore Avenue, um, which is even more congested, causes a lot of backups because the spaces are angled in a way that it's difficult to maneuver. Uh, at this point, I'm quite concerned that these proposed pad-mounted boxes above ground, they're going to take street space, and we're also uh, having to give up a lot of parking spaces. So uh, the whole project to me is going to be, uh, will inevitably cost more than, than the projections probably. There's a minimal amount of grant money that I see actually as a, as a proportion of the project. It's going to be fairly insignificant if I had to guess, uh, at least what we've seen, for instance, it lo you can look at the doc for reference because we're missing like $300,000 that we taxpayers ended up, um, and ended up funding. So between the, the problems with people not, I understand they don't want the above ground um, pole, but the space in that area is so limited already. I think there are just a lot of red flags here. And I, I hope, I guess it seems there's a consensus to move ahead and to continue to pay consultants. But I sure hope there's, there's some consideration to this additional problem now with um, the desire to uh, completely underground the cables is probably not even an option. So then we have to give over more space to these pad mounted boxes. And of course, everybody's like Dr. Trejos who owns or who's a business owner up and down either of these streets. There's always going to be uh, a, you know, a, a, a people, an avoidance to have this obscuring uh, one business or another, but that's sort of, the norm in any project like this. So I'm not sure we can listen to any individual. I, I think someone more neutral has to make those decisions if and when the time comes. So uh, I would appreciate some clarification as to exactly how much money uh, will be spent for additional assessment, evaluation, et cetera, uh, if you vote today not to pause this project. And in fact, you seem to have voted to to go ahead with it. I would, or you haven't, sorry, maybe you haven't voted yet, but you, there seems to be a consensus to go ahead with that, this, and to uh, underground the, the cables to the extent that is feasible, which seems to be these pad mounted boxes. Um, I appreciate your time and uh, best of luck. Thank you, Suzanne. I'd like to, uh, before we call the uh, the vote on this motion, I'd like to pause just a minute. Uh, Kevin Williams, are you there, please? Uh, there is a um, uh, reason for, for trying to conduct this vote uh, to pursue undergrounding because why, Kevin? Thanks, Mayor. The decision on the undergrounding, um, I mean, plays into multiple things. Uh, one, as you know, in the budget that we had, budget briefing we had this morning, we show uh, our piece of uh, the 80-20 split if we were able to get DENREC, or I'm sorry, Del, uh, DelDOT approval uh, for a uh, TAP-funded project uh, moving forward with the streetscape. We can't move forward with the streetscape unless we know what the decision is going to be on the undergrounding because we can't move forward with a design on a streetscape without knowing what the undergrounding situation or the power situation is going to be. So that, that's the criticality of getting a decision on the undergrounding piece. How much, or first of all, if at all, and if, how much, so that we can then move forward with that to be able to develop the plan for the undergrounding so that we can then uh, work, take that information and then go to uh, DelDOT and apply for uh, funds to do start the design of the streetscape. So it's, it's you know, it's an all an integrated kind of uh, 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 process here. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, is there any other discussion before we uh, call a vote? Commissioner LeGree? 
You're muted. Ed has Ed has his hand up before I did. Uh, you can go. Uh, sounds like maybe we should be turning it around and, and or, uh, from what Kevin was talking about, maybe talk about undergrounding first and then decide uh, the, to go forward on the uh, rest of the project. But I'm happy to vote on this. So all right, all right. Thank my, you. Embrace my comments. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Chernowski. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor. I'd, I'd like to just make uh, two comments. One, um, in, in this process, um, when it comes to the point where the engineers are identifying where they think these um, boxes should go, um, I, I just would like to ensure that the task force is, is receiving that and putting their stamp of approval on the locations. Um, and then secondly, I, I would like the city to ask Delmarva Power for permission to um, to either paint or wrap um, those those boxes um, as many other cities do um, to just make them uh, fit in uh, to mm -hmm. the environment a little bit better and and uh, a little make them a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. So uh, those are my two comments. Well, I, um, uh, without committing to either, I'll, I'll make note of both. I think uh, the commissioners are the ones that are likely going to have to give the final say so on placement of the transformer boxes. Uh, you know, uh, that, I, I, I hear what Dr. Trejos is saying and consulting with the business owners, uh, and that can probably be done. But I tell you, it is a challenge. Uh, Commissioner Gossett, uh, I'm sure you remember on uh, the Lake uh, Avenue project that we worked on. We investigated undergrounding. And do you recall the result of asking property owners if they would allow pad mounted boxes on their property? Do you remember how many said okay? Well, I, I sort of back, backing up there, many of them already had the pad, pad mounted uh, on their property. I know uh, Sazio does and the uh, couple of doors down there from um, uh, uh, Stingray, I mean, they existed before because they brought the lines down to the pad mounted transformers and then into the areas. But, you know, most people, when you explained it to them that they wanted underground services were accepted to it. Very good, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, forgive me, but I'd like you to read your motion one more time so we know exactly what we're voting on. Okay, here we go. I would like to make a motion that the city continue to pursue the Baltimore Wilmington streetscape and to continue to investigate the cost and practicality of underground utilities, including vaults to the greatest extent possible. This recognizes that it may not be possible in some areas, not in all areas or any areas. All right, very good. Uh, we're going to do a roll call vote. Uh, so this uh, uh, includes both uh, both topics in one motion to pursue and to pursue uh, undergrounding. Uh, I'm going to start off with Commissioner Legree. Aye. Commissioner Stranowski. Aye. Commissioner Sharp. Aye. That's a yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bennett? Aye. Commissioner Gay? Aye. Commissioner Gossett? Aye. And the chair votes aye, and the uh, motion's carried unanimously. Thank you for your persistence, Commissioner Gossett, in getting that. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Trejos, uh, Suzanne, and uh, Walter for your input. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to go uh, and identify that there is no new business identified. Uh, before we go any further, I want to thank Jim Smith uh, for your time there and uh, coming in front of us today, Jim. I do think I saw your uh, surf fish line uh, tweaking there, so uh, check your for fish before you leave. Uh, Commissioner, announcements or comments from anybody? Commissioner LeGree. Thank you, Mayor. On page uh, 52 of today's Cape Gazette is an article about a series of uh, lectures that are gonna take place at the Boardwalk Plaza Hotel, actually at, at, uh, 
in their conference, Sus Kent Sussex conference room, uh, a series of lectures on the history of Rehoboth Beach. And they're going to be given by uh, Paul Lovett, who is a who knows as much about the history of Rehoboth Beach as any man walking out there. And uh, he has four four different nights of lectures lined up. And uh, uh, anybody who is interested could read the article on page 52 of the Cape Gazette, or they could read uh, Commissioner Gay's newsletter or some newsletters that are coming from Homeowners Association from Main Street and uh, uh, from other organizations VI around town. But I think these, these history lectures are just a tremendous benefit and I hope they will be a tremendous asset to, to, to Rehoboth. Uh, his first one's gonna be on Lorenzo Dow Martin, the guy who laid out the, the street lines and the lot lines of Rehoboth Beach. And uh, uh, it's a very great, a, great, a very fitting, fitting lecture. The Lewis Historical Society is also uh, uh, advertising his, uh, his lectures and they had a journal, one month of their journal that devoted itself to uh, Lorenzo Dal Martin. And I think they're gonna be at the lecture maybe and, and have copies of their journal for sale if, if someone is interested. It's so a great event and I, I encourage everyone to take a look at it and, and make some reservations. I, I am for sure. And uh, thanks, Mayor. Thank you, and uh, might as well give a plug to uh, Boardwalk Plaza that's hosting it because they're also having dinner specials uh, beforehand. So uh, no kidding, I made a reservation and didn't even know it. Oh, there you go. Uh, any other commissioner comments by anybody? Uh, if not, then we'll move along to review future meeting dates. I've got four or five meeting dates I'd like to share with you and the public. Uh, special meeting Tuesday, February 22nd, 9 a.m. That's tree meeting number three. Uh, special meeting Tuesday, March 1, 9 a.m. Uh, anticipating a, a meeting on outdoor dining on public space. Uh, Monday, March 7th, there's a 9 a.m. workshop meeting. Uh, we canceled the budget. We don't need the budget meeting. So I'll cross that off my list. And then Tuesday, March 8th, uh, is another special meeting where we're conducting three permits of compliance, uh, hearings at 9 a.m. So we've got a busy, uh, busy schedule coming up. And with that, I want to thank everybody for, uh, being on board today. We've had a long meetings, uh, with starting off with a budget meeting and then the regular meeting. And I just want to Thank everybody for their endurance. Uh, with that, we'll call this meeting adjourned at uh, five. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor. You want citizen comment? 30, 30 seconds, please. Okay. Walter Birmingham. Okay. Thir uh, citizen there's a, comment. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a streets meeting coming up next week. And, and I'm not picking on the streets meeting. And Ann does an outstanding job. But you can't read the minutes of the meetings until the meetings, um, the minutes are approved. And there needs to be some thought um, to how you can have a tentative minutes made available subject to approval at the next meeting so it does not become months or almost a year before you get a chance to review the minutes because otherwise you don't they're not approved until they're approved and therefore you won't make them available to be printed period. All right. Thank you, Walter. That's uh, that's a challenge, but we'll give it some thought. Thank you very much. Anybody, any other citizens want to say anything? Uh, if not, I want to thank everybody and we'll adjourn this meeting at 5.30.